All right, we'll get started here in a couple minutes. Just let some more people come in. How's everyone doing today? It's Monday, right? It is Monday. Yes, yes, it's Monday. For a second, a few hours earlier, I thought it was Sunday. I forget what day it is like three times a day each day. So that's where I'm at in life. I also realized recently when I was recording videos, <laughs> we'll see if I can still do anything to help fix it, but one of the videos I recorded recently, um, the Jimmy Snow video I was talking about from a couple days ago, it's just a short Jimmy Snow video, I was fidgeting with my microphone <laughs> and I was like, that's not good for the audio quality, playing it back, so... I need to use my fidget cube more. <laughs> I forgot for a second. And uh, yeah, so hopefully I didn't completely ruin my audio for those videos. We shall see. Okay. All right. So today we're going to be watching um, Caitlin Bennett and her husband, I think. I think. Um, uh, Justin Moldau. Don't know if I said that right, but we'll be listening to them talk about why we should convert to Catholicism, um, as well as whoever this guy is. It's his, it's his podcast. Oh, I see his name right here. Timothy something. So that should be interesting. Um, make sure you uh, like the video and subscribe or check to make sure you are still subscribed. Still working on saying that in my videos, but <laughs> Okay. All right, guys, uh, let's go ahead and get started and see what all this is about. Also, just this beginning phase is just great. It's basically me when I'm thinking about watching this podcast or whatever it is. So, yeah, fun, fun, fun. Greetings, Parish Orbits and Retrogrades. Happy Abstinence from Meat Friday. That is 52 Fridays a year. I am here with a most special show today during the midst of what I've called Conversion or Reversion Week. Uh, a couple days ago, I interviewed uh, Elliot Holson. That was really interesting. Today, I'm super excited to interview... Uh, a special, special, special guest and her husband. So I'd like to, to say hello to a new RCIA uh, sis, Caitlin Bennett and Justin Moldau. What's up, guys? Thank you Moldau. for having us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for bringing us on, Tam. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's genuinely exciting. You guys are going through a lot. Uh, Caitlin, you just came into the church. You also just announced that you're pregnant, which is super cool. How long have you guys been married? I like how Caitlin like converts to Catholicism. And now it seems like every every time I've seen her, she's wearing, I, I believe this is what she's wearing. And I I believe it's what she's wearing because I'm pretty sure I've seen it hanging around my aunt's neck. Um, I think she's wearing a Mother Mary pendant. Um, <laughs> I just find it funny that she like converted and now it's like, it's like on her neck every single time I see her. It's just, you got to announce it to the world somehow, some way. Married? Over a year now, so about a year and a half, married on the feast of St. Joseph, March 19th. Beautiful. That That is particularly apropos. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I can't even tell. It's too far away, but it looks like the Mother Mary pendant from this this far away anyways. So St. Joseph. I've been talking about him a lot lately. Uh, again, the end of Conversion Reversion Week will be uh, my friend Milo Yiannopoulos on Tuesday. And boy, these are, these are some great guests talking about the role, either tacitly or explicitly, that St. Joseph had. So Parish Rovers of Retrogrades, I'm excited to bring you... Uh, um, John and Kate plus eight, <laughs> Justin and Kate, <laughs> Justin and Kate plus me. So this, this announcement, uh, I'm going to go to Caitlin first. Really, really good stuff. Your video was really, really informative. What I appreciated about it, I just want to throw out there first is specifics. Specifics are better than. How is it informative? Like, honestly, I mean, I guess he's saying now we should talk more about the specifics, but like that video wasn't informative, I would say at all. Um, in terms of Catholicism, the most that you could say it was informative informative on, at best, I guess, is Caitlin's experience. But um, her experience with atheism is not the way that most atheists would describe it. I talked about this a little bit um, in the live stream that I did reacting to that video. I think a big part of that is if we if we are to take Caitlin on her word, uh, when somebody talks about atheism. Um, after no longer being an atheist, especially if they've converted to like a religious doctrine or in an organized religion, their reflection of their time as an atheist is likely go is going to be warped by their current belief system, right? I mean, it reminds me of um, how when as an atheist, you know, if you come out from religion, the way you perceive your experience with the religion is now under your new understanding of no longer believing. Um, and that's not to say 
either of those experiences are wrong, because obviously as an atheist, I think my experiences with the religion are entirely valid. But I can also see how somebody who is religious, it's like you can't really describe atheism accurately under the guise of now being a religious person. Um, at least it, it, that's that's not entirely fair. You can describe it, but it seems like a lot of people don't really because their religious, organized religious beliefs are so um, going to be so tainted against the idea of people non-believing to the point where even Caitlin had said, you can't truly not believe, you know, her, her, I guess, uh, explanation and in, in talking about being an atheist was basically, she, she mentions, as we've heard a lot of religious people mention how the word of God was, was secretly written on her heart the entire time. And you can't truly be a non-believer. So, <laughs> um, I don't really know what, what, what it was informative of besides, I guess, reaffirming the religious rights perception of atheists um, not really being atheists and just wanting to sin and all of that. So I don't know. <laughs> and gushing, hey, I'm excited to be Catholic. Like, I like the format. The format was not just meaningless That's organization. Fair. Uh, Chronically Disillusioned said it could be any saint. My grandmother wore a necklace of St. Anthony. That's fair, too. It just it looks really similar to those pendants that I've seen my aunt wear. Maybe she wears different pendants, too. I've always seen her wear Mother Mary. Um, she even, in fact, <laughs> little tidbit about my life. Um, the weekend before I was leaving to get married. So for those of you guys who don't know, I don't know if I've ever really talked about uh, when I got married, but I chose to, um, I did not want to have a family wedding for reasons that are probably pretty obvious if you're familiar with my channel. Uh, and his in-laws at the time were based in Guam, uh, which is a U.S. territory, but it's, it's, you know, <laughs> Uh, somewhere, I guess, I, I don't really know where to, I'm really bad at geography, but it's in, like in the vicinity of like Japan, okay? Like close to Japan. Um, it's not in Japan, obviously, but the island is like close, close to Japan. So over there. Um, and uh, before I flew off uh, the weekend before, she actually gave me something blue and something borrowed. And it was a necklace uh, that had a blue Mother Mary pendant <laughs> on it. <laughs> Um, needless to say, I did not, I did not wear it. I was not an atheist at the time. Um, but I did, I was no longer really identifying with the Christian religion. I was kind of dabbling in different spiritual beliefs, um, not organized religious beliefs and yeah, uh, ne never wore the necklace. So, so that was a fun, fun time. <laughs> yes, that's a good, I think that's a good example. I'm so bad at geography, guys. I kid you not, like really, really bad. The only reason I remember it was close to Japan is because his brother was actually in Japan at the time and the flight was like, well, maybe it's probably not that close. The flight was like two hours, I think, to get from where he was to uh, Guam. So his brother was actually able to go to the wedding too. So that was nice. Uh, the way you formatted the video where you announced, hey guys, I'm no longer an atheist. You're actually talking about the way that you puzzled this out. And I, I'd like to ask you some questions on that today. But but first off, I'd just like to say thanks for that. Video. Oh, really happy birth. Ha sorry, I just saw. Happy birthday, uh, be uh, Bearded Heretic or Luke. <laughs> the format was particularly compelling. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, like the most grippy thing from the first part of your video. Wait, is hold on. You I, I'm, I missed something was compelling and I don't know what he said. I'm no longer an atheist. You're actually talking about the way that you puzzled this out. And I, I'd like to ask you some questions on that today. But but first off, I'd just like to say thanks for that video. It was really okay. great. And the format was particularly compelling. Thank you. Huh. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like the most grippy thing from the first part of your video is that you mentioned that you became an atheist out of fear of the truth of Christ, which which one doesn't hear too often. About the same age, I think I started going agnostic because I was growing up. I'm, I'm older than you guys, obviously. In the 80s and 90s church, it was just Susan from the parish council running everything and pretty much still is today. But I was like, wow, what if I'm wrong about all this? What if this is basically Santa Claus part two and all these adults have just entered some sort of social compact to delude themselves? And I, it really wasn't until I was almost 30 that I reverted to the church. You kind of had some of the same thoughts, but going in the opposite way. You became an atheist. Maybe you can tell if, if it's for the same reasons or not. And then you were double guessing your atheism. What if I'm wrong along the way? Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So like I said in the video, I was literally about the age of 12 and I was like, mm, none of this makes sense. The stories in the Bible, there's no way this is true. My, um, my family members would actually tell me that the Bible, the Bible isn't true. And a lot of it isn't true and, and all this stuff and that we don't need church and church is just something else that you can go to, but you don't really need it. And I'm sitting here thinking, 
Well, if all of these things are not true, then how is the premise of it true? And it really, really bothered me a lot being a 12 year old, getting that information because I needed the adults in my life to establish the truth in me and tell me the truth so that I wouldn't go down this path. Unfortunately, that was not the case for me. So uh, eventually I just started rejecting everything. I was one of those cringy atheists that would be like, oh, well, the boat, the Noah's Ark wasn't even big enough to hold all those animals. And <laughs> this is so silly. And it was so cringy. And I, profound, I, would be- <laughs> bro. <laughs> I mean, it's not really all that cringy. I can see it. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I am not di- like completely diverse in Catholicism. And before anyone <laughs> hops in on here or I get any comments saying, well, if you don't know about Catholicism, how can you reject it? OK, we reject religions that we aren't like <laughs> completely knowledgeable of all the time. My familiar brand of knowledge when it comes to religion is evangelicalism, which does which does take those stories to be accurate. I do think that Catholics reject a lot of those stories as being 100% truth. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But again, I don't know that they really believe that a lot of those stories are actually true. And for the most part, they seem to stand behind a lot of what, a lot of science, some of it anyways. I mean, they seem to at least s- sense, you know, uh, the pandemic, I've seen them reject the idea of vaccines quite a lot. So it, it, it's like they kind of pick and choose what science they agree with. Um, I think particularly if I'm recalling like history correctly, I feel like it was as a result for all, I think it was kind of to combat all of the critique they were given because they weren't always so um, evolved <laughs> when it comes to accepting certain scientific facts. Uh and they have a lot of bad history there, as the church itself has a lot of horrible, horrible history to it. So, of course, they try to cover it up by changing their minds and progressing to the best way that they can, um, at least from the classics that I'm familiar with. Like, I know they don't reject the idea of evolution, but then, of course, you get into, like, uh, the... I'm trying to think of what words to say because I'm trying not to get not to get demonetized. Um, when you get into the rights of people with uteruses and what they can do with their bodies, then they kind of go completely against science <laughs> in that regard. Um, but uh, oh, that's OK. Hold on. I have some comments I'm in, I'm intrigued by. Uh, Toilet Frog says, I think vaccine rejection from Catholics is because many falsely believe an ingredient Oh, and the vaccine that that's actually yeah, I've seen some of that too. Basically, it's um they believe there's an ingredient in vaccines that is a uh, that is fetus cells, aborted fetus cells. Um, Captain Sawbone says Catholics feel the Bible is allegory and metaphor for the most part. Yeah, uh, source: I grew up Catholic and went to a Catholic school. Never heard of any Catholics rejecting vaccines though. It seems like there has been at least in my I don't I haven't heard of it like in the past rejecting vaccines. Like I don't think that's connected to Catholicism. But in the midst of the pandemic, I at least I personally know a lot of Catholics who have taken on that whole anti-vaccine mindset, and I think that just that's just being a product of the right wing. Um, that sort of fed into that if, if I'm, if I'm correct, if I'm remembering this correctly. Um, Gustav Dorr says, I believe Caitlin was cringy, but not because of atheism per se. <laughs> yeah, well, nobody really knew she was atheist. Apparently, I mean, it wasn't something she ever publicly said. In fact, I would argue that even though she never publicly said what her religion, her particular beliefs were, she definitely fed into the religious alt-right BS. For example, um, in the last video I did, there was a clip of her and doing uh, an debate about, you know, um, our right to choose not to remain pregnant. And she said multiple times, like, thank the Lord, because Planned Parenthood was, like, getting shut down And I think, one of the states that she was in, or they only had one Planned Parenthood left in the state. I can't remember what the context was. But she said the phrase, like, thank the Lord more than a few times. So I definitely think she was feeding into the the religious alt-right, even when she wasn't religious. <laughs> Chronically disillusioned said the Vatican has told everyone to not do that and says the vaccine is from God. Interesting, interesting, interesting. I would get so mad at people like hearing Bible quotes on Facebook. I'm like, this isn't a youth group, blah, blah, blah. Um, eventually, my brother told on me to my parents uh, for being an atheist. And they told me that uh, they basically threatened me with Bible study, that they were going to send me there to straighten me out. I wish they would have. They never followed through with their word. <laughs> but um, eventually, I just started not thinking about it. It bothered me so 
honestly, if I was an atheist, if I was an atheist and my parents were going to force me to go to Bible study, like if I was an atheist during that time, it probably would have made me even more atheist because I would have been arguing as I was reading the Bible because I, I would have already been, you know, under the perception, I believe the correct perception that it, that it was all BS, you know, <laughs> and I would have been arguing against it. So I don't know, especially since she's converted to Catholicism, I don't know how much Bible study would have actually been able to convert her because I don't think that that's, I don't think as far as becoming a Catholic, that's probably not what fully converted her, but I don't, I don't really even know because I don't know how, how honest a lot of this is. I mean, from her video, she basically says she was converted because she prayed for her cat to get better and then he miraculously got better with no explanation of, of what was wrong with them and she thought he was going to die. So I, I don't really think uh, Caitlin is actually the most logical thinker, obviously, for that and um, plenty of other reasons. <laughs> so bad and it, it gave me so much anxiety. I would lay awake at night like... The current Pope, I agree that he has been... Okay, here's the thing. I think he's been progressive and, and implementing changes. I don't think that that necessarily makes him progressive. Like, progressive as in he's trying to move forward. But I do not think it's anywhere close to enough. And I definitely would not label the Pope as being a progressive, I guess, is what I mean by that. Panicking and sweating. Like, oh my gosh, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? And I can't, I can't tell my followers these things because I'm so embarrassed. I would recommend, I haven't seen it in a couple of years, um, so obviously, like, I don't remember everything. And to be clear, I have a lot of disagreements with, with Christopher Hitchens. I know that that guy is basically worshipped in some atheist crowds. I do not, by any, <laughs> I'm not one of those people, but he has made a lot of good points in terms of religion. And there was a, a extremely well debate, um, about, I think it was like, I forget what it's called. I would just look up a Catholic or Catholicism debate with Christopher Hitchens and, uh, it was really interesting. I especially loved it because there was a huge audience and he was, you know, debating people from the Catholic Church. And at the beginning of it, they were asking, I mean, I think it was like, would we, I think it was, is the Catholic Church a source of good or something? Yes or no? And you you got every everyone like voted using these machines. And at the beginning, there was like a huge, you know, um, I think it was like a little over half thought it was good. And uh, the rest thought it was bad. And by the end of the debate, it drastically changed to the majority of people saying that the that it was not a source of good. It was a really, really good debate. I really recommend watching it. But again, just because I'm recommending that debate does not mean that I stand by because I don't. There's a lot of things that I don't like about Christopher Hitchens. For one, he was extremely pro-war um, and he was also extremely against the rights of people to choose if they want to remain pregnant or not. So that's just like a little taste of what I don't like about him. I'm also pretty sure if he was still alive today, he would probably be... Um, <laughs> he'd probably be transphobic like a lot of our other atheist leaders voices in the public are today. So uh, yeah, not particularly a huge fan of him. Uh, but he he has made some really good points and there are some really good debates that include him. ...of believing this and like I said in the video, the people who agreed with me on this topic were the worst people I've ever met. They treated me the worst out of anybody I've ever encountered and I was like... That's fair. Uh, Gustav says progressive as popes go, I meant. Yeah, which is entirely fair. I think that's true. I, I guess the reason I made that clarification wasn't so much at you. It was more just because I think it gets overlooked a lot where people like you get like a smidgen of like, I guess, good actions from somebody that you, that it seems like a lot of the public have almost like idolized him in a bit, which I don't think that he really deserves that. I think there's like, I think sometimes there's sort of a bare minimum thing. And when you've been getting such shit, then the bare minimum becomes almost like amazing. Wow. Like round of applause. At least that's how some of the public responds. And to me, it's like, I feel like we need to remind ourselves, guys, this is, this is like bare minimum, if even that, like it's not even there yet. So let's, so let's pull back a little bit um, from, you know, congratulating someone for, you know, just having some common sense. It's like, this is, this can't be right. This, this cannot be the path that I'm supposed to be on. Um, so I just was like, fine, I'll go to church with you one day, Justin. And, uh, I realized if I was that scared at night thinking about these things, I probably was wrong. 
yeah, all the appetites, rightly ordered, are good. Bro, hold on. Let me, I need to go back because I'm like missing some of this. I would get so mad at people like sharing Bible quotes on Facebook. I'm like, this isn't a youth group, blah, blah, blah. Um, eventually, my brother told on me to my parents uh, for being an atheist. And they told me that, uh, they basically threatened me with Bible study, that they were going to send me there. What if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? And I can't, I can't tell my followers. Um, so I just was like, fine, I'll go to church with you one day, Justin. And uh, I realized if I was that scared at night thinking about these things, I probably was wrong. <laughs> That's, that's not, okay. <laughs> People are scared of a lot of things. Being scared of something doesn't make the thing that you're scared of a rational thing to be afraid of. Okay. There's plenty of people that are terrified of flying. It doesn't make the fear of flying, like, more terrified of flying than they are to be driving in a car. It doesn't make your fear of flying, a fear of flying rational or logical or, or even, not, I don't want to use the word valid or justified would be a right word. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be afraid of things or that it's not okay to feel afraid of things, that you're not valid in your fear, but that doesn't mean that the fear isn't justified. You know what I mean? You can't help how you feel. But I think if you truly want to get at the root of what you're feeling, I don't think getting at the root of what you're, of what you're feeling or the thing that you're afraid of is just by conceding that, oh, well, I must be justified in that fear. So it must be it must be something that actually exists or that I actually should be afraid of. That's not really like that that that's not how reality works. So <laughs> Yeah, all the appetites rightly ordered are good and natural according to Aquinas. Now, Justin, I want to bring it to you for a second. You actually a lot of people don't know this. You're the founder of Liberty Hangout and I followed your Twitter account for a couple years. Um you're a cradle Catholic, right? And you you had a hand in all this too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, all glory goes to God. I don't want to say it was my doing or anything because I am a cradle Catholic, but I wasn't really, I, I, I want to say I wasn't really true to Catholicism up until probably about two years ago. Because at the point in time when we started dating, the extent of my, uh, my faith was I would maybe pray at night if I remembered and read a chapter of the Bible. I wasn't attending Mass, um, didn't believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. Um, I hadn't attended confession probably since CCD class uh, in like eighth or ninth grade. So I was very far removed um, from the Catholic faith. All the while, I still maintained that belief in God. Look, I don't know enough about Liberty Hangout. I, I, well, I feel like I know enough, but I don't know. I don't know that much. Like I'm not spending my days or weeks or even months like watching their content. So like, but from what I've seen and how vitriolic and hateful they are with their content, um, that's, you know, against equal rights. <laughs> I mean, against people of the rights of people of color and the racial dis disparities that they face um, and racism, uh, not, e not even to mention, I mean, the, the hatred to the um, queer community, <laughs> they kind of fit all of the boxes of supremacism right? Like, like white supremacism. Um, I think something I, f I maybe failed to clarify in my, in my other video, because I guess I think because of my environment, I'm so used to really hateful people coming from the religious right. And I think that's just a, has a lot to do with the product of my environment because I'm around so many, I've, I grew up around so many radical people and they are religious, but sometimes I forget to remember that religion isn't all that, you know, radicalizes people. It's not just that. And there are, there are um, extremely right wing and hateful and radical uh, atheists, um, which I know that her husband wasn't, but Caitlin was. And um, I mean, for them not, I mean, I guess they're both saying they weren't super religious. And obviously Caitlin wasn't religious at all. It's just like, they're just, you know, some people are just, are just terrible people. That's it. <laughs> and I maintain that someone must have been praying for us because there was a moment two years ago. Um, it was on September 8th of 2018 or 2019, rather. I remember the date very specifically, but that's when I was called back to church. And uh, Toilet Frog, who, who the fuck doesn't know that they own Liberty Hangout? I'm sorry. I think he was talking to um, because he was talking directly at Caitlin's husband. So I assume what he meant was that her husband, maybe before he got with Caitlin, actually coined the show because a lot of people just associate Liberty Hangout with Caitlin. And maybe that's just my interpretation. I don't know. But I assume that maybe he had owned it before Caitlin was actually involved. I'm, that's my presumption of what he meant. 
And um, I believe September 8th is the feast of the Nativity of Mary. It's Mary's birthday. And that's the day that I felt the call to go back to mass. And I don't know why I woke up one morning. I said to her, I want to I want to go to mass today. And I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why why do you i'm not going with you fine you can go and, and so I, I went to mass that sunday and i remember the priest gave a really awful homily where he was <laughs> praising greta thunberg and saying how we had to be all you know pro-environmentalism and everything and for some reason you know god's wow <laughs> and that really ticked him off <laughs> i mean that's lovely um you know I can't, I can't remember, I don't know if I'm going to say her name correctly or not. There's a really good, um, I don't know if she's on YouTube, but she has like TikTok and Instagram and like Twitter. Um, Joe Lumen, I believe. She talks a lot about the uh, toxicity and religion and Christianity. And I think she does a really good job in the horrific his, you know, history behind Christianity. Um, I don't know if she's ever particularly talked about Catholicism, but a lot of the radical Christian, Christian, like there's a lot of like radical ideologies that do stem from Catholicism, even for those who know who don't identify as Catholic. Um, like when you look into the history of it and she talks a lot about how you can't really heal religion until you're able to address the trauma and the tragic like horrors and the racism and the proselytization and colonization that is so ingrained in religious history um, that any church can never really fully heal from that. So I do always appreciate when I see these churches that are trying to do better. Um, and, and that I'm sure that includes Catholic churches, but one Catholic church, it doesn't resent represent the entire Catholic Church. And I will say Catholicism is one of those religions that I just don't have a lot of patience for because the history is so abysmal and dark that it like it just doesn't fix it, you know. Um that's not to say that one person that is that is Catholic or a part of Catholicism or that's trying to do better is a bad person. It's more to say that I don't know how much better you can do when you are working under a system that is so poisoned, you know. Uh, um, and to me, <laughs> the Catholic Church is a criminal organization um, for more than one reason, but one of the biggest reasons being how they have covered up the crimes of many of their priests and moved around priests from state to state, not reported crimes. You guys, you guys all know what I'm talking about. I'm not saying the words, but I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. Um, moved them, you know, to different chur churches to protect them, even move them out of the country. There is such a deep history there that is so awful. And I think even, um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it was where the actual Catholic Church is, that they found, um, you know, unidentified remains, like hundreds of remains of women and their children. Somebody else can look into it for me. But um, there, there's just, there's literally just such a dark history with all of it. And I just don't think you can move past that by, by trying to I guess, cover it up or sugarcoat it or show how, pro how progressive your church is or your teachings are as a part of the Catholic church. It's just, it's not, it's not going to work for me, at least. Still kept calling me back to Mass each week, even after that experience, you know, I was very blessed to understand, you know, even though that wasn't the best homily, this is still the place that I need to be every single week. And from there, um, it became a journey for the two of us very, very quickly. Oh, it's miraculous, isn't it? The, the overcoming, the overstepping of the presbyterate and the episcopate that one has to do to keep going to Roman Catholicism, to keep, you know, going to the, the source. And that's what we do every week. And it's 90% of the priests and probably 95% of the bishops. They're all doing their thing. We won't get into that. And, and yet it's still the one true faith. It's, it's unbelievable. That makes it, Caitlin, quite a time for you to enter the church, right? The, the reign of number 266 and, you know, Francis the Humble, as Time Magazine used to uh, have us believe. It's not really believable anymore. But what, what a time to come into the church, right? A time of crisis. We need all hands on deck. So in, in a weird way, it's the best time to come in the church at its lowest. I'm having a lot thrown at me. Very so hold on. Is are they saying the church is at its lowest because they are because some members of the church and leaders in the church are leaning towards are leaning towards like left 
left politics. Is that what they're saying? Is that what I'm getting correctly? Hold keep on. Keep going to Roman Catholicism to keep, you know, going to the, the source. And that's what we do every week. And it's 90% of the priests and probably 95% of the bishops. They're all doing their thing. <laughs> we won't get into that. And and yet it's still yeah. the one true faith. I assume, I assume that would be the issue. And I, I believe there have also been um, some Catholic churches that have welcomed uh, the LGBTQ community as well. And I'm sure they have an issue with that too. It's unbelievable. That makes it, Caitlin, quite a time for you to enter the church, right? The, the reign of number 266 and you know Francis the Humble, as Time Magazine used to uh, have us believe. It's not really believable anymore. But what, what a time to come into the church, right? A time of crisis. We need all hands on deck. So in, in a weird way, it's the best time to come in the church at its lowest. I'm having a lot thrown at me very quickly because usually I would imagine when people first convert to Catholicism, they only have a small group of friends that they talk about these things with. And there might be some pushback from Protestants or anti-Catholics, but being on a public scale, it's like, I'm so glad that I have gone through so much, you know, physical mobbing, but also internet mobbing, because at this point I can withstand even the pressures from my own followers and the people who support and subscribe to me who are doing the exact same thing um, as all of these liberals who have hated me for years, you know, lying about the church. And I won't say it's lying. They don't know what they're talking about, I guess I, I would say. I don't think they're purposely lying. I think they've just been lying about the church. What it, I would love to know what exactly you think are these lies that are about the Catholic church misinformed um so i think all of that has kind of prepared me to be in this moment where i am right now to where i can look at this and i can accept that they're saying it and then it leads me to ask more questions so uh i mean people have accused me of doing this for money you do not i'll be honest like just thinking about this because i know people that don't like my content because you know i'm an atheist and because i'm being hard, hard critical very critical of the catholic church would probably be like well you don't even know anything about catholicism you admitted it and it's like i really don't need to know anything about the religion that you're teaching when i can at least have a bare minimum understanding of the history of what the catholic church has done historically you know <laughs> not go into the Catholic faith in America if you want to make money yeah, uh, no. as, a, as that's not something you do. Uh, instead, you just kind of go to, um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, recipes of it, it, it speaks for itself. Look, Catholics have always been the minority here. We've always been odd man out. I'll the be honest. And I know a lot of people are pushing back against this, but from hearing Caitlin's story, um, you know, there's a video that I did Oh, way back when, when I was still doing my TikTok thing and then I tried to start going over to YouTube, but I really didn't have the time to do YouTube. So there's only like a couple videos that I left up from that time. Um, I think it was would have been back in 2019 or 2020. And there was a video I did about, I believe it was titled, um, could you be an atheist for the wrong reasons? And, you know, it is possible and this is the problem with, with some atheists. They they have this superiority where they think that we're we're just so much more intelligent and and like <laughs> acting like all atheists can't do any wrong because we're all logical thinkers. And and we're not. You're not just a logical thinker by default just because you're an atheist. And not being atheist doesn't make you illogical. Um, at least not on the scale that some atheists like to paint people that are not atheists, you know. Uh but it is possible to be an atheist and not be a skeptic. It is possible to be an atheist and still be tainted by a lot of hateful um, beliefs that can stem from the religious alt-right. Uh, and it is certainly possible to be an atheist and not really be able to defend your position on your non-belief. Um, and uh, I do think that it's possible, entirely possible, especially because of the environment that Caitlin has built around herself, um, you know, with her political content and how, how much it attracts the alt-right um, and the fact that she is married to somebody who's Catholic. I don't know if I personally believe that this is j just her grifting. Um, I did go into it when I first saw this and did think that, um, but I think it is entirely possible that Caitlin is just very naive. I mean, we've seen plenty of examples of how naive she is, um, and we know how hateful she is. And I, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if she believes this now, like it really doesn't. Um, so I, I don't know if I think she's, she's just doing it for money. I definitely think capitalizing on it is a strategic move, um, but you can capitalize on things and exploit, exploitate part of your life with, 
and and while still sitting behind what you're saying. You know, you might be over exaggerating or using it to gain profit um, and create you know more views for your channel and more and thereby more money. Um, you know, and also being invited onto other channels and continue to explo exploitate it. Uh, I think I'm using that word correctly, or I feel like I'm saying the word wrong. But anyways, um, and you could still believe what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like people, people use parts of their life, especially YouTubers, because of what of what we do. We can use part of our life to gain profit, like all the time. It doesn't mean that what you're what you're saying is wrong. You know, it's a part of the job description. Um, so could she be taken advantage of it? Yeah, I don't know that I think she's outright lying. Um, at least not in this in this part of it. I don't know. You know, not, notwithstanding the majority we usually enjoyed on. That's Spring a good. Court, um, Gustav says I think Caitlin is naive, but also oppor uh, opportunistic. Yeah, that would be a good way to say it. Notwithstanding our inefficacy on the court to do anything badly, but yeah, it's, you wouldn't do that. To people said the same thing to Milo when he came back to the faith. Look, I mean, he published. He published. I got it right here. My first book, Catholic Republic, when he was it was giving a talk called. The Catholic Church is right about everything before he was back in the faith. I mean, when he before Welcome he back, so Queen of Beams. It's, it's not that. It's the opposite of an ulterior motive, which is the one, you know, proper teleologically driven motive, which is truth. And uh, it's, it's self-evidently so. You don't go into the faith to line your pockets. You don't go teach the truth of the faith uh, informally or formally to line your pockets, uh, especially with your followers, which you mentioned in your video. I like... I mean, that's not true, like, as a whole. Like, you're saying you don't go into... You don't go into it teaching the faith to line your pockets. That's just not true. That's just not true. You can believe the faith and still use it as an opportunity to line your pockets. Pockets. I mean, look at the Catholic Church. Look at what the Pope wears. <laughs> you know, like, come on. That's B that's BS. Like this, you BS. say that a lot of times you'd have when you when you do your thing, which is hilarious, by the way, going to the university <laughs> campuses, trolling them all. Uh, excellent. You would announce your atheism to. Yeah, like, I'm sure Jesus would be real fond of that behavior. You know, if he existed, if I believed in Jesus, I'm sure. He would be real happy with what Caitlin's doing. Hmm. Mollify the mob to quell the masses. That also, uh, tax the church. Thank you. <laughs> That's and, and you felt bad about that later. It's got it carries a number of implications. None of them are good for anyone on the atheist side. That, that's really interesting. Wait, yeah. So hold that on. specific implications. None of them are good for on the atheist side. Hold on. Like mollify the mob to quell the masses. That that's and, and you felt bad about that later. Uh, it's got a you know, proper teleologically driven motive, which is truth. And uh, it's, it's self-evidently so. You don't go into the faith to line your pockets. You don't go teach the truth of the faith uh, informally or formally to line your pockets, uh, especially with your followers, which you mentioned in your video. I like this. You say that a lot of times you'd have when you when you do your thing, which is hilarious, by the way, going to the <laughs> university campuses, trolling them all. Uh, excellent. You would announce your atheism to like mollify the mob, to quell the masses. That that's and, and you felt bad about that later. It's got it carries a number of implications. None of them are good for anyone on the atheist side. That that's really interesting. I mean, honestly, I might be sup I, I would have been surprised by Caitlin announcing her atheism. Um, I would have felt kind of like shame a little bit, which is like weird because even though we have atheist communities it's not like our all atheist communities are the same you know because there isn't like a, a atheist doctrine but um you know it's always kind of a shame when you hear someone who, like it'd be like it's like finding out somebody's um like a, a part of the queer community and transphobic you know what i mean <laughs> like it, it would be it would it would suck you know but I don't know that I would personally, and I don't know how honest Caitlin is being, because it's like, I can understand being surprised, but the, she kind of played it off like, it's almost like they had more respect for her beliefs because she was an atheist. And I'm like, no, like, I would not be there at all. I would be, like, intrigued, like, wondering, how are you this hateful and you don't even have, like, religion to blame for it? Um, you know, but as I said earlier, there are plenty of, there are plenty of right wing ideologies that can suck people in, um, particularly people that have been miseducated or have a lot of fear that has turned to hatred, you know, um, in their mindset uh, that that do, you know, fall for these alt-right uh, beliefs. And obviously that we have a lot of, there, there's a lot of issues that are outside religion that can take root and, you know, grow in people's minds when it comes to prejudices and when it comes to um, a hatred for minorities and marginalized groups. But yeah, I definitely wouldn't have been like, oh, you're an atheist. That's cool. 
Like, go ahead, go ahead and do your thing. Do your thing, girl. Keep keep talking shit about everyone. Keep being transphobic. That's totally fine. I get it now. Because, like, we're both atheists, so, like, it's totally cool. No, absolutely not. Yeah, so that specific moment, I didn't go into details in my video because I wanted to keep it about what mattered. But I remember the very first time I had been mobbed, I had one giant security guard. The police refused to help me. I was getting burned with uh, hot coffee on my skin, and people were trying to literally, like, just <laughs> kill me. Uh, and were they though? Were they though? <laughs> Were they? I'm getting flashbacks of that one time. <laughs> this is like kind of random, but this is how my brain works. I just got like flashbacks of the one time Blair White like posted a photo of her, I think after getting like a MAGA hat torn off her or something, or her, her husband got a MAGA hat torn off him. And then she posted a thumbnail and it looked like it looked like she had a black eye and she failed to clarify for so long because people were going crazy about this and she never really like clarified it. She might have said it somewhere like v very vaguely and quickly, um, I'm sure. But a lot of people jumped on this wagon that she had a black eye when tr when it, it was actually just her makeup had smeared. Nobody like hit her or anything like that. So I'm getting like flashbacks of like, <laughs> is that really what happened? <laughs> you know? Or were people just trying to get you to go away? I mean, Caitlin goes to these communities to deliberately be antagonistic. She goes to places where she knows everyone's going to disagree with her to poke them, you know, metaphorically speaking, and to get these types of reactions out of them. Um, and it's like you're putting yourself in that situation and you expect people to what? To not ask, like, to not ask you to leave them alone? I mean, if, if I see somebody going around and, like, pestering a community that I identify with, it would piss me off, too. I would want this person to leave. Like, nobody there obviously wants her there. You know, it reminds me of how much she, like, whined and cried during um, a protest that I think she has on her video. Uh, it might have been the video, the, the video that I watched a very small clip of last time I did a video on Caitlyn. Uh, where somebody was following her around as she was, you know, antagonizing the um, the pro-choice community. And if somebody was just following around, like reminding people, hey, you don't have to answer her questions. You don't need to answer her questions. Don't entertain her. And she got like so upset by that. And it's like, what do you expect? Nobody wants you there. <laughs> like, what are you doing? And this guy was running after me and I was trying to leave campus. And he was like, you go around telling gay people they're sinners and they're going to hell. And I just stop in my tracks and I look behind him and I'm like, I'm an atheist. I have never said that. And it's like he had a, a, a light on his face. He was like, you are? You are? Bullshit. Bullshit. You're with how? Caitlin has said like some of the worst stuff about the queer community. And I'm guessing the person that she's referencing would know that and that's why they were asking her those questions and it's like there's no way that if somebody who said the stuff that caitlin has said who i know is homophobic and has spewed such hateful rhetoric they'd be sh that when she'd be like well i'm an atheist i would be like oh well that's okay then that's totally fine no what the fuck if that happened then shame on that person you're an atheist and i was like yes so leave me alone you're lying about things that i believe in he was like I didn't know that. I'm so sorry. Uh, Chronically Disillusioned said, I don't know, though. Her anti-abortion beliefs don't seem to me that she was actually an atheist. Well, as I said, I do think she coined, like, or not coined. I think she, um, particularly, because she never publicly said she was an atheist. And I do think she appealed to the religious right in many ways, um, including her, her, you know, beliefs on abortion. Um, but to be fair, there are plenty of atheists, not a whole lot, but there are atheists who are still very much, uh, anti-abortion. So, um, it doesn't surprise me too much. I do think that the way she displayed herself, especially in those videos that she did where she was, you know, particularly targeting people that, you know, think that it is a person's choice whether or not they want to remain pregnant. Um, it does seem that she definitely... She definitely wanted to be appealing to the religious right wing, you know. Um, but of course, now she's a Catholic and Catholics are kind of <laughs> they're a big. Uh, 
well, they're hugely pro-life, but they are also behind a lot of a lot of organizations that push these anti-choice anti-choice rhetoric. Um, I believe the Catholic Church is also behind the um, f- I, p- the pregnancy crisis centers. That when you first see it from the outside, it may look like a place that you could go if you were looking to end your pregnancy, but it's really all basically a trick slash trap. There's nobody there that really has a medical license, and they're basically just there to fear monger you into not get it, not ending your pregnancy, pretty much. And I believe the Catholic Church is also behind that. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I am fairly certain. Um, this is where my my aunt and I particularly had like a huge falling out because of well one some of her earlier on homophobic beliefs which I think have have mellowed out since since we spoke about it but she is extremely extremely anti-choice and we had a lot of disagreements about that I mean and she's always posting a lot of like propaganda um, about Planned Parenthood and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it made me really livid (laughs) that and the fact that she's extremely pushy. So I think like one of the final straws, like that I had when I was still in contact with my family, like regular contact with them was when back when I used to have Facebook and my, my partner had Facebook, she was like posting things to his page. Actually, I didn't have Facebook at this time. That's why she was posting things to my partner's page. But she was literally posting things about natural family planning, which is basically like where you, she's extremely against birth control, right? So it's basically like where you um, have intercourse, but you don't use anything to interfere with that. It's weird because I don't know, like, I don't know if she was against the use of condoms, but a lot of Catholics are, I mean, I I believe if you're, if you're against, if you are against like birth control, um, for their reasons, logically, you would also have to be against like any form of birth control, and that that would include condoms, from my understanding. But I know that's not a belief that all Catholics would necessarily adhere to. But based on their core beliefs, I would think you would have to be against all forms of birth control, not just like the pill. But yeah, so that's that 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 was a fun time, fun time. I I didn't know, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is not. I don't want to be friends with you. Like I don't want your sympathy. If that's what I had to say to get this person to leave me alone and get out of my face and stop trying to hurt me, that was not the place. That is not the answer. That how are they trying to hurt you by calling out your homophobia? Even if they made a wrong assumption about you, um, I mean, an assumption that would be quite reasonable, I might add, because of course people are going to assume that Caitlin. You're living in America and you are spewing a lot of alt-right beliefs. Of course, they're going to assume that you are some form of Christian, okay? And it's not like, again, Caitlin knowingly never clarified that she was an atheist for many reasons. The biggest one being because of the content she pushed out. Given that was not right. And ever since that moment, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, this can't, this cannot be the path that I'm supposed to be going down because it's dirty it's it's so dirty and uh, that was one of the moments in my life where i was like wow i'm so confused like i'm what i mean i agree that the path she was and is going down is dirty but like her reasoning because what because there was somebody apparently who was an atheist who liked the fact that you were also an atheist and that wait what like what? Oh, okay. I might, I might seriously need to do some digging. Um, and I made sure to tell him, do not put that in the video because my microphone caught it. And I said, do not put that in there. Do not release that. I'm so embarrassed. We'll pretend it didn't happen, but it's something I've always thought about. And I'm kind of glad the interaction happened. While it was embarrassing, it needed to happen for me to think about it. Something being embarrassing doesn't mean that you should be embarrassed for, I mean, you could be embarrassed for wrong, the wrong reasons. Plenty of people experience embarrassment for the wrong reasons. Like her embarrassment stems from the way that her audience would perceive would perceive Caitlyn as an atheist, you know, like being embarrassed of something doesn't doesn't make doesn't make your cause of the embarrassment like justified or anything. So like that doesn't mean shit to me. Yeah, the holy efficacy of shame, right? I mean, you you grew up in. Uh moderately protestant family it sounds like so you probably knew the story of like peter denying christ in front of the mob is that what what was the force of the shame no 
<laughs> I did not grow up in um, a household that talked about Christ, that talked about the Bible, the saints. I didn't even know what a saint was. And that's another part I was going to bring up later. Um, once I started asking these questions to Justin, I literally n- knew nothing. I, knew, I did not know. This is how much I didn't know. And this is probably why it scared me so much as a young adult and a teenager. I didn't even know what the Trinity was. I did not know that. I did not know that God and Jesus were the same but separate. And I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. I had no idea. My church growing up that we went to a couple times uh, did communion with a tortilla wrap like a burrito and grape juice and we would go down to the basement afterwards the kids would and we would finish the grape juice and the tortilla wrap i love the people at my church they're my old church they were great and they send me a happy birthday card every year um (laughs) but that was my experience yeah basically like going to a a taco a really really uh covid 19 (laughs) i mean I don't really know. I don't have a lot. I mean, I I have, I find it hard to believe that she wouldn't know what those things were. I mean, maybe they're taught differently under the Catholic church, but I'm like, how would you not know what the Trinity is? I don't know. I just find that hard to be hard to believe. I think as well as the Holy spirit. Like, I just find it hard to believe that she wouldn't know what those things were. I don't know. Resource depleted Taco Bell that had grape juice or something. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Like like an extra cheap Taco Bell talk. What was, Justin, what was it like? Were you guys dating when she was doing all the, the college campus trolling and, and people were st- spilling hot coffee? I kind of like to get to this at the end. I'd like to talk to you guys about some secular stuff based off of what both your projects are. But were you dating at all when you'd see people treating your woman like this? Oh, yeah. And I guess to make a long story short, um, you know, it was me founding Liberty. Yeah, it's interesting because it's interesting because the. Um, sorry, I was thinking. Uh, Gustav said atheist arguments against abortion are about scientific specifics of when life began and what is human. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because like a lot of like I, it seems like a lot of Catholics like to emphasize the fact that they are like pro science or they stand behind science. But then it's like but then they still pick and choose. When to when to stand behind it, you know, um, and it's also just not entirely true. Like, I don't really understand this whole, like, superiority that some Catholics feel when they engage in discussion about religion and the idea of lack of belief. Like, well, you just don't really understand Catholicism. You have to go through the education. You have to go through the teachings of it. And it's like, why would that change? Like, even if you think the, like, Old Testament or the Bible is metaphor, like, why would I suddenly believe in, like, magic, essentially, because I go like it it just doesn't really like add up to me (laughs) like I don't I don't really get I don't really get the the appeal to it um it and I don't really understand how you can claim to be behind science but also actively and I don't I don't even mean not have beliefs that go against science because that's pretty common. Like a lot of individual people may have beliefs that go against science, but to have movements that completely go against science, you know, um, like in terms of, you know, the right for people to choose whether or not they want to remain pregnant. Like they just so ad- advocately like not only go against science, but even spread false information about about the science um, behind conception. So that none of that adds up to me. Hang out and already having a platform that allowed us the opportunity to go and start making videos together. Um, because before I met her, I'd be the one in front of the camera making videos about politics. And then, you know, she got over her nerves and anxieties. Like, I don't want to be on camera, but then she became a pro at it. And that's when we started doing the college campus visits or just interviewing people on the street. And so for me, as the cameraman, it was always an interesting experience because everything that you see in every single video of ours is from my personal uh, perspective. So when we were at these campuses and she was getting mobbed, that was a really defining moment for me too. That was uh, a year after we had been engaged and our wedding was only about a month away. And I remember seeing all these students attacking her, throwing uh, objects at her, hurling insults, just really vile and nasty. And for me, I truly felt like I was witnessing the passion of the Christ in that. People like threw toilet paper at her. Wait, whoa, what did he just say? Hold on, what? Moment. And um, every- Maybe I'm misunderstanding. But I was thinking of, like, the movie Passion of Christ, and I'm like, are you comparing, like, the way they were treating Caitlyn to, like, the way they treated Jesus as he carried the cross? 
was it just I thought that was the reference there maybe he's just saying he like felt it in his body <laughs> or something like the Holy Spirit but like please tell me you didn't I don't know let's just keep going <laughs> every time I mention that people are like oh you're comparing her to Jesus this wasn't No, he, no, he did. So he did. I think it's great when men see, you know, their partners um, on a pedestal and, you know, love them and idolize them in a sense to an extent. That's great, you know sort of <laughs> but this is probably not the way that you want to lift up your partner I would say <laughs> Whew, no wonder Caitlin has such a huge ego <laughs> Jesus Christ uh oh people are gonna get mad at me because I just used Jesus Christ as a curse word oh no I should really stop doing that. It's almost like making people mad is kind of fun, though. Oh, God. Hopefully that that, that might be a thing me and Caitlin have in common. <laughs> Ew. No. No. The passion of Christ. No. But we've even talked that with our uh, parish priest. And he said, yes, you know, if Christ truly lives in you, then in that experience, if she's a baptized Christian, that is reliving the experience of the passion. Cause when the mob was, you know, coming after her, it was, it, it was like, I was seeing the mob say to Jesus, crucify him. And I think it was at that moment that I knew this, this is going to stop talking. Stop. I'm not even like, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know. I think, I feel like my, like the ex Christian in me is coming out because I'm like, how are you doing this? <laughs> like, what is happening with this? This It's making me really uncomfortable for some reason. And I don't even believe that Jesus is like, you know, the son of God or anything like that. But this just feels like really, ew. I think it's because of, I'm trying to think of what it is that's really upsetting me with that. I think it's because of the authoritativeness we find with a lot of a lot of groups that have really prejudice uh, beliefs that they feel very authoritative and they almost take on the act of of just the ego, I think. I think I think maybe that's what's getting to me because it's like, holy shit, like you really think that highly of yourself. Wow to be a, a very defining moment in our lives that will change us for the better and, and oh and the other thing too is like when you th look at the story of jesus christ and i mean what was happening when he would have been carrying the cross up to his death i think that thing like it's also just such a false equivocation um and this idea oh okay i feel like i'm understanding what's really upsetting me here now a little bit too see sometimes i like i know why i'm upset or i can feel that i'm upset but I don't really know why. So I'm trying to figure out what it is that's really upsetting me. But I think it's like the the victimization that's coming with it too. To have the to have the goal to compare yourself to like some to this fictional, in my opinion, fictional sacrifice. Like to think that that that's the comparison that you need to make. Um, it's really weird to me. And uh, it does kind of go in line, though, with a lot of with a lot of alt-right beliefs, because um, they truly see themselves as both a victim and the superior at the same time. So I always tell them not to say that because people jump straight to she's not Jesus. And I'm like, no, I'm not. We're not saying that at all. It's just the treatment of the things that I stand for. And I've always stood for more Christian beliefs and a Christian lifestyle. And I didn't even know it. They're, they're that's not true, Caitlin. You did. Okay. To say, she obviously did know it. That's why she felt shame to ever and, and never wanted to admit publicly that she was an atheist because she knew what audience she appealed to. And she knew that that audience was mostly religious. Lots of Catholic trolls too, you, you know, doing what I do. I'm sure doing what you do, uh, both of you. 
And there's nothing worse than a Catholic purity spiral. You know, when people like, you said you're Jesus. The thing to do is just be like, yes, I said I'm Jesus. That's what, <laughs> what are you talking about? Literally anyone that knows any. Okay, we obviously understand that she's not literally, they're not literally saying that Caitlin is Jesus, but you are creating a false equivalency that d displays how highly you must think of yourself in order to make that comparison. And also how much you must victimize yourself in your head to make that comparison. And it is extremely insulting considering that this is a response of people, most people who have either been marginalized or, or are allies of those who have been marginalized um, pu pushing back against the hatred and beliefs that you spew publicly using your platform, you know, and to have the gall to compare to victimize yourself in that way and act like you're a victim in that situation to the extent we are going to make a comparison to the way Jesus Christ was victimized in that story, it's it's insulting. And I would say it's probably even, in some cases, even more so insulting to other Christians, especially progressive Christians who understand the, you know, um, the, the I what's the word I'm looking for? I, I mean, I don't really, I can't think of the another word, but other than hatred, the, you know, the hatred that Caitlin spews and understand the, um, the impact that Caitlin has and can have on marginalized groups because she provides a space for bigots. Thing understands that all human suffering properly consecrated is uh, uh, unification to Christ on the cross. I mean, that's literally what it's called. We have prayer after prayer. Human suffering is unification to Christ on the cross. Now, you have to take that moment and, you know, bestow the formal cause and say, I, I, you know, I'm giving this to Christ and I let me be unified to him on the cross. But with all due respect to your detractors, it sounds pretty gnarly. I mean, I, I'd really like to get into why were the cops? I want to stick with the Catholic stuff first, but real quick, why were the cops not helping? I think they simply, uh, well, there was a cop that came up to me and said, you're making these people block the road. You have to move. And I looked at him. I said, I'm one person. I can't do anything with a mob of 400 people. And he goes, well, you need to do something. And I said, can you take me somewhere where I will be safe away from these people? And he said, no, he smirked and he left. And when he left, the mob just got even more emboldened, knowing that the cops weren't going to stop them. Uh, if you watch the, the whole video from OU, you can see the cops all laughing. Ca Caitlin, uh, all you needed to do was leave. What do you mean? Can the cops take you somewhere? Like, just leave. And if they weren't letting her leave, I think that that is a problem. I think at the at best, if she wanted to leave, the cops should have helped lead a pathway for her to be able to leave. But it's like you chose to be there. Of course, people are going to because you have a huge impact. I don't think that Caitlyn should have ever, you know, been made to feel unsafe in that situation. But I'm also like, how unsafe were you actually, though? Like, what actually happened to you? Like, did, were you actually harmed? Or are you just mad because a bunch you pissed a bunch of people off and they all started yelling at you and throwing things like toilet paper? And for the record, if somebody did actually throw hot coffee on her, that is completely unacceptable. Um, I have yet to hear of like how if she was like burned by this coffee. I've heard this story before, but I don't think there was ever any like proof or like that she was like actually hurt. Um, which obviously if she was if she had a hot coffee thrown at thrown at her she would have been burned. I don't know for sure if that happened. I'm absolutely like, I don't think that that's okay. But like, what do you expect? Like you actively promote content that hurts these people. And then you go to a, a lot of places. Like, for example, I, I don't know what event she's particularly talking about, but there was an event where I remember seeing her on video engaging with cops and they were asking her to leave. They were saying, you know, you're putting yourself in the situation. You're antagonizing these people. You're the one that is causing the problem. And the best thing for you to do is just to basically leave is what they were telling her. And she was at a queer, like an LGBTQ pride parade. So it was like, of course, of course, people are upset. You know what I mean? Like, what do you expect? Like you're a hateful person who's pushed a lot of hateful content and you go to a place where people are supposed to feel safe and celebrate who they are to, you know, create problems. And then when you get the problems that you that you wanted to create in the first place, then you want to cry victim about it. Uh, and then the cops came out and said, oh, there may have been some water splashed. We don't know, but it's not a big deal. And it's like, no, actually it burnt my skin. It was coffee. Um, I think they were scared. I think they were scared because we see what happens with liberals and BLM supporters and cops. They didn't want to fight. I'm sorry. I don't 
know that I believe that she was actually burned by coffee. Okay. I don't really think that we should be throwing like hot liquid, potentially hot liquid on anyone. Do I really care if she had water thrown on her? Not really because water's pretty harmless, but you know, anything else I would take an issue with it. But I'm just kind of like, if you were actually burned, you would have, we would have caused such a more, you know, bigger up war about that because Caitlin would have been in the right if she was burned by somebody throwing coffee on her. Like you could have literally sued somebody for doing that. Like, if that was actually the case, she could have sued them. So, from my understanding, that could, why, how would that have been the case? Because there would have been such a bigger issue being made here because Caitlin would have been in the right. And you know how, we all know she's, oppor she's an opportunistic person. So, like, why wouldn't she do that? So, I don't know, I don't really buy that she was actually burned by somebody throwing coffee on her. I don't know if I believe that. Um, I don't have seen anything that demonstrates that that is actually what happened. They didn't want to have a riot on campus with the police versus students. Yeah, I think I tend to be, you know, charity and all things, but I, I have good reason to believe that with these cops that have bowed down before BLM over the last year and a half, which is really vile. I've seen it's anecdotal, but I've seen with my own eyes in DC at the first stop the steel rally before the January the sixth thing. I, I stayed away from that, but I was out there with a lot of other um, a lot of other folks, Catholic and, and non Catholic conservatives, and the cops were turning people away. Literally, they turned one guy away. I didn't see this, but it happened like 15 minutes after I crossed the spot. Same cops. And I saw it on a video later once, I, you know, I got, I got six kids and a wife. Um, we're just, we're doing the two mile walk back from Liberty Plaza to our RV. And I see uh, just once we get back to the RV, right at that spot, cops turning away a guy. It's like, look, this like BLM mob is bothering me. And the cops are like, don't ask us, bro. Or whatever they said to him. They turned him back out. He ended up getting beaten up. That is the stuff of like Dark Knight Rises. That's a Christopher Nolan film where the cops are in on it with the crooks. That's what's okay. happened. It makes... Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. The cops are in on it with Black Lives Matter. Yep, that's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I can't speak on the situation because I don't know the situation. I don't even know if I, I can't really speak on if I believe what he's saying is actually true. But I will say, I don't know the context. Do I agree with somebody beating anyone up? Of course not. Absolutely not. But I don't know the situation t enough to know whether or not this guy was antagonizing it, whether he made the first move, like if it was a situation where he could leave, you know, like just not be there. Because it seems like if you, especially because a lot of these people want to cry when you're, sh when you're at, a, if you, I'm assuming they were at like a Black Lives Matter protest and antagonizing these people. And it's like, if you feel unsafe, then leave, then move yourself away. You can have a protest and an anti-protest, basically, in the same vicinity and also make sure that there is space between the two groups so that both groups remain safe. Okay. When you cross the line and you start getting in people's faces, even if it's verbal, like you're asking for freaking problems. Am I condoning anyone punching someone else in the face? Of course not. But I'm also not going to condone somebody who is purposely trying to create these, these interactions. Like you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Okay. Um, but for, for the record, if it were to have happened that somebody got beat up then obviously I'm against that. Obviously, I'm not okay with that, okay? I'm not okay with violence starting in any sort of protest. I am okay with someone defending themselves <laughs> if that were the case. And I also think there are situations where you're deliberately creating that unsafe situation, okay? And I think that's also a problem. We'll push this to the end because you're, you're saying Liberty Hangout has changed uh, ideological direction of travel some. Um, I'd, I'd like to suggest people need to go back to a more uh, liberty focused sort of mistrust of mistrust of, of government and government agents. But we'll, we'll kick that to the end. Um, it's, it it's interesting because blue lives only somebody actually said this. Yeah, it was Gustav. Uh, blue, blue lives matter, man. And the thing of it is with a lot of the religious right, they only matter to the extent of how they can utilize that phrase against the black against the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, because in truth, they're not, especially now, it seems like they're definitely not as pro-government as they like to claim themselves to be. They're like pro-America, but like only to the extent to which it benefits them. I mean, you see in a lot of places like with the alt-right wing, like they talk about how they think they're going to like overthrow the government, <laughs> you know, all the time, because that's ultimately what they wish to happen. Like if you were, if we were ever to implement pro-gun laws, you know, they have this fetishization, like, fantasy 
of people of like government officials or police coming to their doors and like taking their guns and there's all these different tiktok videos and whatever of them like you know getting ready and like loading their weapons and acting like well not their actual weapons because i think you're not allowed to show actual weapons on tiktok but pretending to load guns (laughs) in order to prepare themselves for like the cops coming at their door which obviously what does that imply You know what I mean? So they're not actually, they don't actually care about, about cop lives. They certainly don't care about the cops who have unalived themselves in the aftermath of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Blanking. Uh, the, not protest, but what happened, the event that happened at the Capitol, at the Capitol, the, when they stormed the building. I mean, there was, um, I forget how many, but there was cops that died there and there was, I believe two, if I'm remembering correctly, but there's also been a lot of cops that have unalived themselves after that incident, you know, and I know at least one of those cops died absolutely like brutally. So they really only care about cop lives when it's, when it's going to convenience, their um ideology and whatever agenda that they are pushing you know that, that had to be hard to see though and, and god bless you guys and, and keep you both keep you both safe you don't do the campus stuff anymore do you? uh yeah i've um i i do remember this chronically disillusion said i'm not okay with her threatening to pull a gun on people who disagree with her but i seem to remember her doing it allegedly no she did now now to be clear she didn't say i'm gonna pull i'm gonna pull a gun on you but somebody got in her face they didn't even touch her they got in her face because she was deliberately antagonizing them i don't remember what she said but i think that they were i think she was picking on her weight if i'm remembering correctly And she basically said, I carry just so you know. And it's like, what do you think that that means? Like, so, so what people aren't allowed to yell at you and call you a name or something without you threatening. Like that is such a huge problem. And it is such a problem with people who anyone who really promotes this idea that we have that we should have a right to like publicly carry guns on us, whether it's concealed or not, because it is it's threatening. It's like what? So you think you're just you're just going to shoot someone because they're saying some words at you that you don't like or you're getting in your face. Even if, even in like public altercations, even though I'm against violence and I wouldn't, I would, you know, I wouldn't condone getting into a physical fight with somebody. Fights happen. Like bar fights happen all the time. I don't completely condemn somebody because they got into a fight. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think it's fair that we are living in a country where it's like, I felt like my life was threatened because somebody like punched me or somebody threatened to punch me. And this wasn't even that case. Like this, this girl never got close to actually like hurting Caitlin at all. But there was an implication there. Like if you do the wrong thing, I can shoot you and claim it was self-defense because you made me feel threatened. That's like really like bizarre to me (laughs) that we live in a country where you can basically, you can basically do that. Like it doesn't really make sense to me that someone can pretend that they felt threatened because somebody just got in their face and screamed at them or even if somebody punched them and then they were like I felt threatened so I just shot him and killed him like that is, it just does not at all add up in my mind how we live in a country that like can condone that and call that self-defense you Caitlin no ever since I um got pregnant we decided that that part of my life was behind me it wasn't uh, yeah, Gustav says you don't bring a gun to a fist fight. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Worth um, the last campus I went to, when we had to have a police escort take me off campus. Six security uh, guards. Six security guards, and it's just it's not worth uh, someone trying to hit my belly uh, while I'm pregnant. You know that they would try. My security guards have had to. Literally- okay, I do not at all believe anyone would try to hit that. If anyone who would do something like that is disgusting, I do think that it's unsafe for Caitlin to do that while she's pregnant. Not because I am of the belief that somebody would purposely attack her but because things can happen especially if you're like antagonizing a crowd like I'd be worried about her getting pushed over or somebody you know throwing something or just any anything like that I mean for her own safety I wouldn't think that she would want to be in that place but at at the same time like even as a leftist I wouldn't want to be in the middle of a like if I were pregnant I wouldn't be at one of those protests anyway because that's that's exhausting like I would be scared something could happen I'm also clumsy I'd probably trip or something you know, like there's a multitude of things that could happen. Um, and I wouldn't want to be in that. I mean, it'd be like going, <laughs> it's like, it's like if you're like pregnant and it's like, I'm going to go to a concert and hang out in the mosh pit, you know, 
you know, like, no, that's not something you would do. I don't like how she's painting it like the left, anyone that's on the left or like it at, in these groups that she would go to, or they're going to like deliberately hurt her or try to cause a miscarriage and harm. Like, that's ridiculous to me. Like, no, come on. Literally take people that are about to hit me with skateboards, pick them up and just throw them away from me. One of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> Shout out to my security guard, Jake. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of where we are. So we're just gonna, we're gonna move on from that. While it was really fun and I'm really going to miss it, it's it's a new chapter. It, it's time to put that to rest. Yeah, amen, amen. I, I wanna ask you about abortion in a second, but I have a, my-, my... Oh, yay, my favorite subject. My next book that will be out in August of 2022 is uh, my fourth book. I'm co-authoring with Dr. Michael Robillard, and both of us are, you know, trained trained academic philosophers. He's an also throwing skateboards is not okay. It's not a call to hurt hurt or uh, kill the person that might be throwing the skateboard. But if she actually was having a skateboard thrown at her, like that is also not acceptable. Um, I think unfortunately people do not think rationally when they get angry, and Caitlin goes to these events to purposely rile them up. <laughs> and make them angry and cause these interactions so she can get them on camera. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I don't think as I'm pretty sure with my, with my political beliefs, if I was specifically going to uh, any sort of right wing, sorry, getting the hiccups, any sort of right wing gathering or protest. Um, and I was deliberately saying things to upset them. My safety would probably be in danger too. It's because of the environment that you are putting yourself in and what you are doing in that environment to cause such vitriolic reactions. Because a lot of people aren't going to have, everyone's riled up and they're not going to, I'm not saying that they're not going to be liable for any action that they were that were to take against you, but to completely act like there's no blame there and you're not purposely inserting yourself in a situation to create these types of antics to, you know, be able to record them on your camera and then paint them as being bad people just for this reason is really, like, logical. I mean, we don't really need to do that. We especially don't need to do that with the right wing because, I mean, they're violent all on their own. Um, and obviously, that's not in the right of it. But um, I do think you're creating a space to cause that interaction, uh, especially considering Caitlin loves to remind us, mind everyone, buddy, that she's carrying, which obviously carries the implication that you're saying that you're going to, like, you're threatening to shoot people, <laughs> you know? Ex-Army Ranger, West Point guy, uh, you know, 88th Airborne. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like what happens when you go to a protest carrying an assault rifle around. Um, even if you're not actively doing anything, uh, it's threatening and it's going to rile people up when you're walking around with an assault rifle. People are going to feel afraid and that fear is likely going to induce anger and it is likely going to create a dangerous situation for everybody involved. Um, very tough, dude. We're both big guys. And the book is going to be called Don't Go to College. And what? And it's going to yeah. be on Regnery. And the thing that sold Regnery on this book, they're like, we don't want to really do an education book. They asked me for a book and I'm like, I want to do this book with my buddy, Dr. Michael Robillard, the academic tough guy philosopher. They're like, yeah, education book, that ain't going to sell so well. And then I'm like, wait, I had a meeting with all of the heads of Regnery, all, all six of the most powerful people. I go, I'm going to change your mind tomorrow. When I came in, I was like, this ain't an education book. This is a revolution. You know, I can get behind some of the aspects of don't go to college. I think my my reasonings are probably going to be a lot different from their reasonings because I think there's a lot of good things to learn from college. But I just um, I don't think the debt is worth it. Um depending on what you're going to college for and what you want to educate yourself for. I think it is not, I think it makes it extremely hard to progress in, a, in society when you, when you start off in so much debt. But we unfortunately also live in a society where it can be difficult to find jobs without a college degree. But there are also plenty of jobs that you can find without a college degree that pays more than some jobs you could get with that degree. I mean, just for example, like I don't have a college degree and a lot of the jobs I've had, even though they didn't have the benefits because I was doing them part time, paid significantly over minimum wage and in paid more than my partner's jobs have paid. And he has a college degree. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I'm assuming their whole thing is they're basically against education because they think that the college colleges have been um infiltrated by the left basically because uh you know education makes people leftist which i mean that's a that's a hot take <laughs> to say the least
Bin book, right? This is a burn it down and salt the earth book. And they're all like, okay, we're doing this book. And I was yeah. like, and then the other thing is, the, the other thing I told them right before they said that is, I'm like, so we write this book and as it's debuting, uh, me and Mike do a don't go to college, college speaking tour. And we start at some of the biggest places and we get like a sign up list and we tell students like, come away from college with us. Like we'll lead a procession through the campus and it, kids will joyfully skip to their freedom where they're no longer indoctrinated by the gods of, of uh, Pornea and uh, you know, Dionysian orgiastic energy, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> college is indoctrinating people into what now? What? <laughs> What did he just say? <laughs> Whatever it is, and, and they're charged hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. But so we're, we're gonna we're gonna deal with some of those little blue-haired skateboard freaks too. But but uh, I look forward to it. It's rewarding. I will say that it's very fun and rewarding. But I thrive in confrontation, so yeah. I assume you do too. So you will love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but wait, 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 amen, amen to that. But you're pregnant now, and um, that, that that's beggars an important point of. A departure for you, which was even when you were an atheist, according to your video, Caitlin, you were always anti-abortion. And this is something that like, I don't know if it's just some touch point for people with half decent common sense or what, but yeah, even in all those years where I was kind of a low, oh my God. low functioning agnostic, almost atheist away from the church. It was always like, well, obviously abortion's wrong. You can't go around killing babies. And that always. And that's the problem. That's the core of the problem. If you view abortion as killing babies, then you are purposefully not understanding what terminating a pregnancy is on purpose and you are also misguided by your emotions even if you talk to atheists that are pro-life or anti the choice of to, to end your pregnancy um for other people to end their pregnancies if you listen to any sort of debates or have conversations with any of them all, all, most of their main points, it all comes down to these emotional ties that they have to the idea of a human being. Um, and the, the fact that they, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Elevate. They elevate the potential life, um, of a fetus or they elevate the molecular life of a fetus over the rights of the pregnant person. Um, and to me, it is completely not rational. And a lot of it is tied to certain emotional aspects. Um, even my aunt that I mentioned, which I keep talking about her, but it's like one of the main like things I really, you know, <laughs> push back against with her because because of her religious beliefs and because when she, you know, converted to Catholicism, it was like she became a diff completely different person. But, um, you know, she is very much obsessed and I mean, like, seriously obsessed with the pro-life movement. Um, I mean, she's one of those people, and I kid you not, she literally got in trouble <laughs> because she went to a Planned Parenthood. And for one, she started planting flowers in their flower beds, which she tried to paint as being this nice thing. But it's like, this isn't your property. You can't just go up and start planting flowers in, like, some, some of their flower beds. But what she did was she planted the flowers there, and then she also tried to place a statue of baby Jesus in front of the Planned Parenthood. So, <laughs> but um, to add further context, uh, this person that I'm talking about cannot have children. And she was in a previous marriage where they were adamant on them not having children. And now she's at a, in a place where she's much older and she feels like she still can't have children. And also her current partner, I don't believe, really wants children. So I also think that's where a lot of this obsession comes from. It's And that that is a very emotional place to be at where you are so against other people terminating their pregnancies, but also you are blinded by your emotional response um, to the because of the fact that you are unable to have kids and you can't really understand the perception of somebody who chooses to terminate their pregnancy because it's something that you can never experience and you wish you could experience. So, and her warped perception, I'm sure people who terminate their pregnancies are, you know, very selfish um, people and the whole organization that enables people to terminate their pregnancies is obviously some sort of like evil organization. Now, obviously that is also connected to her religious beliefs, um, but I do think it stems from a very deep rooted place of like her and pain because of her own experiences. 
excuse for me was a call to well, I can't be a full-on atheist because like Ivan Karamazov says without this guy who is this guy uh Honestly, I don't know anything about this guy. I, from what I can tell from the pictures when I looked him up, I, he's he must be like a Catholic uh, podcaster who who uh, focuses a lot on Catholicism, from my understanding. But that's just from the very minimum research I've done on this guy. Oh God, anything is permitted. This intense intellectual and instinctual sense that we have, like you can't go around killing human beings. That has to be tethered to something at the end of the day. Atheists can't tether it to anything, though. How did you work that out? Hold on. Hold I don't on. know if it's just some touch point for people with half decent common sense or what. But yeah, even in all those years where I was kind of a low functioning agnostic, almost atheist away from the church, it was always like, well, obviously, abortion's wrong. You can't go around killing babies. And that always, for me, was a call to, well, I can't be a full on atheist because, like Ivan Karamazov says, without God, anything is permitted. This intense. That's not true. That's not true. There are, there. <laughs> I don't know where this logic comes from. This is what really boggles my mind when people try to paint atheists like this. Well, without God, anything is permitted. Then why aren't there more atheists that are that are committing crimes? Why isn't a large portion of the atheist community, given that it is a smaller community, the non-religious community, I should say, is a much smaller portion? Why is there not a more disproportionate rate when it comes to the crimes that atheists commit versus the crimes that the religious right commit? And it's because, like, how can you say that if without God, you know, anything goes? And it's like, but you're not even seeing that actually represented within within the atheist communities, you know, because because what creates hateful people, it's it's ideologies, it's belief systems. It's not lacking a belief in God that or believing gods don't exist that creates this this hatred for society, because at the end of the day, we are still a species that has empathy because because naturally because we're social species like it it just it doesn't it doesn't make logical sense to me even if you look at other species now given you know the animal kingdom you know outside of our species is obviously a lot more violent and harsh than anything we've created because we've created systematic you know governments to keep people in line and and rules and laws and whatnot but even if you look at other species, like they also have certain amounts of empathy for their own species. And they can also, especially if you look at other social species, they have certain, um, you know, cultures and sometimes that they, they may create depending on the species within that community. And like, I guess, rules that they sort of follow, especially when you look at like elephants or dolphins or orcas. Um, or chimpanzees. So, and it's like, they obviously, as far as we know, they don't have like some sort of God belief that they believe in. How are they able to create their little like groups and societies? You know, it, it just, it doesn't, it, it clearly to me comes down to the amount of empathy they feel and the culture that they are, that they are in. And it, it, that's, that's exactly what, what happens with, with the human species to me, be it on a much more, um, wide scale level because of our abilities, because what we've been, you know, given the ability uh, to do um, as far as the societies and stuff that we've created and becoming what I would perceive to be like the dominant species on earth, um, unfortunately. <laughs> so it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. This It's like they just completely ignore the fact, like any other aspect that could be, that could be involved and in human beings... And why they care about other human beings. They just completely ignore it and say, well, you don't believe in God. So, and then they'll say, well, the reason you don't, if you try to say, well, I don't have a desire to hurt other human beings, they'll say, well, that's because God is written on your heart. <laughs> so of course you don't have a desire to hurt other human beings. And it's like, did God only write his word on humans? Is that what it is? Like why, why, when you look at other species in the animal kingdom, like other, which is also God's creations, why, when you look at them, are they all, are they so, you know, violent and they, they will, um, in order to protect their own, they will, they will attack humans, you know, if they are provoked or, you know, like it just doesn't make any like logical sense to me. Uh, all of this just, <laughs> This idea that because we're God's creations, or I guess we're supposed to be God's chosen creation. So that's probably why they see animals. I mean, most of them will say animals don't even have souls. 
to be fair. Now, some Christians disagree with this. I don't really know what the Catholic stance is on it. But, I mean, according to the Bible, we inherited the earth and all of God's creatures are basically made for for us. Like, we are the ultimate species, I guess. So, that would probably be their stance on it. But we've also displayed that we're not the only species with morals. Even if their morals may differ, other species also have morals. And it's like, where does their morality come from? Even if their morality is different from humans... Why are, how are they able to build any sort of morality, other social species? How are they able to build it without a God? You know, like, and, and if they, if I would say in the biblical sense, sorry if I'm rambling here, but I would say in the biblical sense, if, if it was God that gave other species the ability to develop morals, then wouldn't it be immoral to create a world in which they are basically owned by another species or like where we have dominated over that species to literally create a world where we can do- where we are meant to dominate over other species like why would god even create animals to be able to create morality and i to me it just displays the fact that it doesn't come down to a secret word that was written on our hearts but it comes down to the fact that we are a social species because these types of like and these types of behaviors are very are very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, centered maybe like, or they, they derive from, from social species specifically. And to me, I think it's because of our ability to develop empathy. I think that's where it stems from. And we're just, we're not the only species that can, that can exhibit that. We're just not. Intellectual and instinctual sense that we have, like you can't go around killing human beings. That has to be tethered to something at the end of the day. Atheists can't tether it to anything though. How did you work that out? So I majored in a biology degree. I have a bachelor's um, in a, a biology degree and I love science. I, instead of reading books, I would literally read my genetics te- textbook. I would read my evolution textbook. I love science. And from a science perspective, it was always common sense to me that this has been a child, a human being from the moment of conception. And it, it was just blatant. It was just obvious to me. So, How is that obvious? How? Like, when you look into what we define as human, as human life, like, it doesn't make sense to me because we know that what we define as human life doesn't come from our bodies. It doesn't come from the fact that we may look human. It's a part of what always boggles my mind when you have pro-lifers, like, showing the baby at certain stages and oftentimes lying about, like, the growth of the fetus, like, oftentimes lying about what stage you know, the fetus looks like what? And it's to appeal to emotions because there's like, look at it. It looks human. It's human, right? And it's like, what What do you think a dead person looks like after they die? They still, they still look human. They still are human. But the fact of the matter is, it's not just the act of being human that defines a, a viable life that is deserving of, of rights to the extent that they should be allowed um, to stay, to remain inside the body of somebody who, who does have, who does have personhood. And I mean, from my understanding in science, we know that all of these things that really create who we are at, at the core, it's not like a soul. And I'm speaking from somebody who's an atheist who, who Caitlin claims to have been, it comes from up here. So how can you say that at the moment of conception, um, an embryo has all of the same rights as a human when they haven't even developed any of the things that that we identify as being human to the extent where, uh, like, if you're brain dead, for example, you're dead. Why are you dead? Because of what's going on up here. You know, so it just, I don't know how from a scientific perspective, you can say that as soon as conception hits, Okay, like I can understand more gray area with some of them, you know, and obviously that's why we have, you know, we've regulated, we've regulated abortion, but I just don't understand the, the logic, especially when it's so early on. And I also don't understand the logic of like the heartbeat, you know, like, oh, well, when you can detect a heartbeat, then obviously it's human because the heart's beating. And it's like, that's not, that's not how life is defined. Like your, your heart pumps blood. That's it. And of course, that's like very, very quickly skimming over the fact that the heart is actually not developed when you when the heartbeat is detected and pulsing cells, pulsing car- cardiac cells are not indicative of an actually developed human heart. Uh, but, you know, I digress.
So that's how I've always taken it is taking a science approach to it. But at the end of the day, I was thinking, you know, we would have these conversations about abortion or my Christian. I like, I, I, oh, no, 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 no. I keep doing that. My belly uh, while in textbook. I love science. And from a science okay, perspective, there we go. it was always. Um, I was going to say, what was I going to say? This also completely ignores the fact that there are, there is actually a community of atheists who are actually pro-life. Like, I, it's like they're, they're talking as if they don't even know that that's a thing. So, and they probably don't. ...sense to me that this has been a child, a human being from the moment of conception. And it, it was just blatant. It was just obvious to me. So that's how I've always taken it, is taking a science approach to it. But at the end of the day, I was thinking, you know, we would have these conversations about abortion or my Christian friends would have conversations. And I kind of turned into more of an abolitionist rather than a pro-lifer. And the abolitionists do not want you a part of their movement if you do not incorporate God into their message. They also don't want you if you are a Catholic. <laughs> so uh, we'll put that out there too. So I'm kind of in my own little group by myself. And um, so I started wondering like, well, if this is inherently wrong and if all people have inherent value, how can I prove that scientifically to all of these liberals, to all of these pro-choicers? And I couldn't. And I never brought up God or religion with any of these pro-choicers that I did meet. I think, I think to be honest, it's because, it's because especially the, the secular pro-life community, uh, movement, blah, blah, or the atheist pro-life uh, movement <laughs> is, is flawed in the sense that it's not really strong enough to stand behind anything. That's not to say that the religious right actually has a leg to stand on scientifically, but they can use their religion and their emotional and spiritual and magical beliefs to justify what they, what they think because, because of the concept of a soul. So obviously you have, I obviously, I disagree with it to be clear, but there is more understanding and I guess there's, there's, you're able to validate your beliefs more and stand behind them more when you have a belief that there is something magical about human life and that there is actually a soul that is given, you know, to the fetus at the moment of conception and the value that a fetus has at the moment of conception when you're able to when you're able to draw it back to spiritual beliefs of like a soul and like god and all of that um i understand i don't agree with it but i understand that that more than somebody who is an atheist to be honest trying to make arguments from a scientific perspective because that doesn't hold up to me um and i it still boggles my mind that it holds up to some of these pro-lifers i also did a video on this um i did a whole video on uh um combating uh secular arguments uh for being pro-life or anti-choice because I didn't want to go there and have that, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm an atheist. So, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm an atheist too. And, and we can disagree on this on a scientific level. It just, right. Um, somebody said you're not even pregnant after conception. It just takes time before science to confirm the pregnancy. Yes, but they do, from my understanding, especially with Catholics, from what I understand, they do see conception as being, and even, I think even like the pro-life movement within the atheist community, they do see conception as being the point that human life exists, not pregnancy. It is the moment of conception. That's why, um, for example, I don't know, I don't know about the the majority of the pro-life atheist community, but I know that the pro the pro-life movement as a whole, um, and especially obviously you know Catholics because they're anti birth control, are extremely against the Plan B pill because uh, even though Plan B doesn't terminate pregnancies. It can potentially flush out um, a, uh, um, a fertilized egg before it implants. So that's why they're extremely against the Plan B pill. The argument was just lacking. It was lacking a lot. And I did not have an answer for why we had value. Because scientifically, that's, that, that can't be answered with science. So um, now being pregnant and converting to Christianity, Catholicism, from that viewpoint of a secular pro-life view, it has made everything like a hundred times more important. And what I say about abortion, I remember just falling on my knees, crying, reading some of these pro-choice comments from people one time. And I, mean, I was crying so hard. I ended up just vomiting everywhere because it would make me so sad and <laughs> emotional right now. But it just, uh, you know, I, there's a reason why I've always felt like that. And I think, you know, having my own baby. Now. I used I used to say I would never have babies. I hated babies. I, I didn't support killing them, but I didn't want them. I didn't want to be pregnant. I didn't want to ruin my body, you know, and it's just man, cringe. It was so cringy and it's so embarrassing today. Yeah, but 
It's interesting how she's like, I was always really against that. And like now she's kind of talking about being pregnant and how that's even more so changed her beliefs. I've heard from the perspective of somebody else who was pregnant. And um, I think they were a little later in their pregnancy than I was when I terminated my pregnancy. But they were talking about how like you're, there's certain hormones that go into your body that instinctively make you not that like want to protect it. You know what I mean? Um, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily rational or that what you are doing is wrong when you terminate a pregnancy. Every pregnancy is different. But yes, there is a certain like chemical response that can happen that can sort of make you sort of push you back against wanting to terminate the pregnancy. That does not mean that you were wrong in wanting to terminate the pregnancy. There are certain certainly chemical reactions that happen that aren't always justified. I mean, it, it, it's kind of like baby fever, right? Just because you have baby fever at some point um, doesn't necessarily mean that you actually want to have a baby or justify your reasons. That instinct or emotional desire to have a child, a lot of times those things, first off, those things can be um, fleeting, you know, as in it's, it's temporary and it goes it goes away. But it's also not really based in rationality. It's just certain chemicals because, of course, as a species, um, the drive for how our species continues is through reproduction. That doesn't mean, especially in our society, we don't, people don't have to reproduce to keep our species going. But there is an instinct inside of all of us, I think, as a product of evolution, um, that, that can have certain desires when it comes to procreating. That's not necessarily based in, like, some sort of rationale. And it doesn't prove that, oh, this is what we're supposed to do. If you have a uterus, you are made to procreate. That's not what that means, okay? It doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> we can have certain instincts to do a lot of things based on certain chemical reactions in our body. That doesn't mean that those behaviors are ever going to, like, are necessarily immediately justified or rational or that it's okay to engage in a certain behavior just because you have an instinct to, to do so. You know what I mean? And it also doesn't mean that, it, you know, if you have an instinct to do so because of some sort of chemical in your body, it doesn't make it wrong. It literally just depends on the outcome. You know what I mean? Like, is it, will the action harm other people? Will it harm yourself? Um, it, you know, all, all of that stuff. But I mean, look, you, you cringe, but you got a good head on your shoulders. You always knew abortion was wrong. And this, by the way, this issue can't be adjudicated by appealing to biology. As you know, that's just a, that's a dead question. That's a, a dead letter. That issue does that goes nowhere. Biologically, you got 46 chromosomes of human life, and it is it meets the standard biological definition for life from conception. This is biologically a human being. A uh, little human being, uh, fetus just means baby in Latin, and mm. so the the horizons sort of contract that much when an atheist who rejects God is talking about the moral lyseity of of killing a little human. It's it's no longer an abortion discussion, is it? For an atheist, it's just is it wrong to murder? That that's that's a, a Christian exactly. precept, and that's not that's it's a completely dishonest, uh, and it's literally just coming down to the fact that they see they equivalent fetus fetuses to babies outside the womb and um what was i going to say and and we don't cuz like to say that we are justifying murder it's just not honest because i don't most atheists um and also atheists who are leftists are going to be against a lot of the things that result in the harm uh, of people and that would include murder that would include things like the death penalty and you also have these people saying well they're talking about justifying murder and most of these people and i believe caitlin certainly um if you're if you're a part of the alt-right you are definitely pro-death penalty so there's also these exceptions there the difference is we don't see humans that are inside somebody else's body as being as having a right to life that exceeds the rights of the pregnant person to terminate their pregnancy or not terminate their pregnancy or what they want to do with their body. That that's the core problem here. <laughs> okay. Um, and and the fact of the matter is they see it as they do have the right to life that it, that exceeds the rights of the of the pregnant person, basically. Um, and it, it ultimately comes down to the fact that forcing people to remain pregnant is going to increase in, increase poverty rates. It's going to keep people that are in poverty um, a, a prisoner to that poverty and I, and not to say that capitalism doesn't already do that on its own but certainly un, unwanted pregnancies will even exceed that to the extent or keep you keep you as as far deep into poverty as you can possibly go um and uh, it also you know controls the ability of pregnant people to to you know exceed to 
go after certain jobs or certain careers. And there's just a whole multitude of things that comes down to really just controlling people with uteruses. And that's it. Uh, so. And the atheists can never, can never answer that question. Like you, you talk to, go look at Richard Wait, Dawkins. Can never guys, answer what Talking question? about the moral lysity of, of killing a little human. It's, it's no longer an abortion discussion, is it? For an atheist, it's just, is it wrong to murder? That, that's that's a, a Christian exactly. precept. And the atheists can never, can never answer that question. Like you, you talk to. But the thing is, is like that side can't answer the question either because they're they're OK with murder in plenty of different circumstances. They're OK with it when it, it's legally self-defense. They're OK with it even if it wouldn't be legally self-defense. They're OK with it <laughs> as long as it's a white person with a gun. You know, they're OK with it when it comes to the death penalty, even though there has been loads of evidence that that shows disproportionate rates of people of color being jailed for crimes that they didn't actually commit. And there is obviously evidence that there is always going to be a certain percentage of people that are that died due to the death penalty that is that they were in of their crimes uh there's also an issue of people who committed the same crime but being different skin color white people get a must, much lesser sen sentence than a person of color and y there's so much disparity there but they don't care about any of that they don't care about any of that so it's like what do you mean how can we not answer that we're pretty i feel like our side is pretty straightforward and what we believe and what we don't believe i i don't think a fetus has rights that exceeds the rights of the pregnant person that doesn't mean that i am like pro murder in fact i would say there's a lot of there's a lot of beliefs and viewpoints from the alt-right that would that would say that they were pro murder so that that doesn't really add up to me go look at richard dawkins the guy's a joke he's talking about cringe he attempts to answer this question and it makes one laugh it's almost you almost feel bad for him atheists literally can't say they're it without a with Creation requires a creator and any kind of moral. No. Okay. Creation requires a creator. Your problem is at the, with the very first word of creation. <laughs> okay. There's sand on a beach. We can explain how, how we can explain how, how sand comes to be, right? We can explain it as a result of certain events that happen in nature that doesn't mean that there is a creator. We can explain rocks and 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 uh, boulders and fossils, all of that with si with science. There's literally no need for a creator. And like, you don't look at a stick on the ground or a pebble and think, "Wow, somebody must have created this." You know, like that. But if you look at a watch, you're gonna say something. You're gonna say, "Well, somebody had to create this. Why?" Because it doesn't actually appear in nature by itself. There's no evidence that watches just pop out of nowhere or fall out of the sky. We know that somebody created that. Um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> not sorry. There isn't actual evidence that we are a product of creation. Okay, at least not to the extent that goes beyond reproduction <laughs> you know how did I came to be well my parents had a happy fun time together and then I came into existence eventually after nine months of pregnancy <laughs> um so in that sense you could argue that your creator is I guess your parents um but to say that to say that creations require a creator that isn't that's not going to appeal to me because I don't think that we are like that this universe is a product of creation. A law requires a creator. If you reject the creator, then how do you say I would ask people when I used to do atheist debates uh, in, in person, like, dude, we disagree. You probably don't like me much. You're an atheist. Why not? OK, I guess there's the binding force of law. But aside from that, why not kill me and eat my face? Right. Or bash my brains out. There's no answer. Because I don't want to. What? You're seriously going to say there's no answer for why somebody wouldn't want to kill you or bash your brains out. That's really, that's, that's the intellectual argument that we're going with. I mean, there are definitely better arguments <laughs> when it comes to theism than, well, you don't want to kill me and bash your brains out. That doesn't really make sense with your atheism, right? You have to believe in a God to not want to do horrible things. What? <laughs> Morality does not come from God. If it came from God, then we wouldn't see morality displayed in other social species. Other social species would not have morality if that were the case. Answer that will avail them. And, and so the abort it's not an abortion question, it's a murder question. Yeah, no, that, that describes it perfectly because then the argument is not, is this a human? The argument is, 
can we kill? Can, can we kill people? Also, I forgot to point out, too, the concept of creations must require a creator. And usually the religious the religious perspective of creation is something that is complex, right? If it shows a certain level of com- complexity, then there must be a, there must be a creator behind it. I would argue that some sort of superior being that would be referred to as a god that w- was able to create us, if they to have the intellect to create this world, wouldn't that in itself by that definition, by the definition of creations being complex and being intelligent, then the god itself w- w- would have to have a creator. And they can never answer this question because then they go to, well, he just always was. And it's like, okay, the universe always was. Like, what does that mean? Like, they, they fall back to every creation needs a creator. And then, but they, but it's, what's the word I'm looking for? Some type of fallacy. Um, it, it's, uh, I can't think of the actual fallacy that it is. Uh, I, I guess like special pleading, I think, because it's like, but you're only you're only saying that to the extent of which it works with your worldview, because you can't you can't explain under that perspective why a god exists in the first place, okay? Because a god would have to be superior, superiorly intelligent, extremely complex, the most powerful thing that would ever be into existence, and yet somehow that did not need a creator. That is not a creation, but we but we must be. If you think if you think God doesn't need a creator, then why why would we need a creator? Where it's much much less powerful and complex and intelligent than a God would be if one were to exist. Like, how do you explain that? Well, and why is it wrong to kill people? And if it's not wrong, because there's no authority or anything that you can say that makes sense why it's wrong to kill somebody, then your argument just falls apart. And that's something that um, it really just means so much more to me now, understanding that a baby comes because God wants it to be, wants them, he, she, to be there. And one thing that- Caitlin, honey. That's not, that's not how pregnancy happens. I don't know who told, (laughs) I don't know who taught Caitlin how pregnancy occurs, but that's not it. Okay. (laughs) That I've helped- kind of tell other people and something that's helped me in the abortion argument is that I don't think God makes mistakes. And if this baby is here in any woman's womb. Another lovely special pleading argument. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. So if you're pregnant, you are meant to stay pregnant. It's like that only works in certain situations though, doesn't it? That, that argument, it's like, okay, God doesn't make mistakes. You get cancer. Sorry. Why do doctors exist? Why do we need doctors? Why do we need eyeglasses? God doesn't make mistakes. Why are you so upset at queer people being queer? God doesn't make mistakes. What's, why does all of that upset you? Like it, it, the logic, it's like, it only works in the, in, to the extent of it fitting your agenda. That's it. God did not put them there by mistake. And if you want to take creation and everything else into your own hands and reject God's plan, then that's on you. But I'm not going to do that. And one thing about the Catholic Church that really, really, really just solidified. The way that you could use this whole argument about rejecting God's plan and just you could you could put that argument into so many different scenarios and it's like it's not it's not valid because it doesn't work in every circumstance it literally only works when it's convenient to you to the agenda to which you are pushing because if that to that extent interfering with God's plan would be dyeing your hair putting on makeup um like like getting eyeglasses like all of those things would somehow be interfering with God's plan why this is the right path for me is Justin explaining to me and showing me um, passages from books from popes and saints talking about how contraception is bad, uh, tying your tubes is bad, um, all, all this stuff relating to. That is the, the obsession that I see come out of the Catholic community when it comes to when it comes to a person's right just not to remain pregnant or to or to choose not to ever get pregnant is so mind-boggling like bizarre to me their weird obsession with people with uteruses that's it they have this obsession with uteruses 
Like, we can't, we can't even take methods to prevent pregnancy. We're just supposed to leave it to God. It's just, it doesn't make sense to me. It's like, why do you wear a seatbelt, dude? Just leave it to God. Why, why do you not just cover your hands while you drive? It's all, it's all, it, just leave it all to God. We're not allowed to take any precautions to stop certain events from happening. Like, seriously? sex and marriage and creating life and the amount of passion and theology and love that goes into each part of those discussions from the Catholic church is so amazing. It's so profound and it makes sense. That's the most important part. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I just explained why everything that Caitlin just said literally doesn't make sense to me. And I don't need to know everything about Catholicism to say that because what she is saying does not make freaking sense. <laughs> It doesn't make sense. Um, it seriously boggles my mind that a group that is so well known for being so against our rights to choose to not remain pregnant can also be against the methods that prevent pregnancy. You know, I can at least have more respect for the atheist pro-life community because at least at least they push for healthy sex education. You know, at least they are are for birth control, at least birth control that doesn't that that wouldn't eliminate a fertilized egg. I, I believe that they would probably still be against Plan B because from my understanding, they still think that the at least m the majority of the movement, from my understanding, thinks that it is at conception, um, which would be before you're pregnant. So. But as far as birth control goes, like, they're not against that stuff. I can at least have more respect for them to that sense. But to be, to be, a, to be against abortion and also against all of the methods that would prevent abortion from occurring in the first place that could help prevent unwanted pregnancy or at least, at least um, minimize the amount of unwanted pregnancies that can occur. It's just uh, so, so starkingly hi hypocritical and it, logically it's it doesn't it doesn't make any sense it's literally just wanting to take if you have a uterus they just don't want you to have rights over your body period as far as that it makes perfect sense and talking about how it makes sense also makes sense it's not just like you know having a synod on synodality or something stupid like that only an idiot would do that right um that's an insider's joke but it, it's talking <laughs> sensibly about how a decision that one came to made sense as one came to it is very enlightening that's what i loved so much about uh, your video Caitlin, it was, it was, as I said before, really, really well done. People remember, uh, like, subscribe, uh, click the bell, leave a comment. I like cookies or in the UK, I like biscuits is good enough. Um, the, Caitlin in her video all, mentions, uh, Justin, that I nearly did the uh, Josh Justin thing. <laughs> like me my whole life. Justin, Caitlin mentions in her video, this simple fact, it's kind of what we were talking about two questions ago. She had a Catholic, a Roman Catholic husband and a Roman. I wonder if he's going to talk about the whole cat story, if he's just going to skip over that. <laughs> Cause it was just so bad. Like, I'm like, are you going to talk about the fact that God saved her cat or like, nah, <laughs> we're just going to ignore that bit in the video. In <laughs> Catholic wedding before she became Catholic. Now, famously, some people say infamously, I'm, I'm currently stumping this book, the case for patriarchy all about <laughs> as priest prophet King of the household. I'd like to actually send you guys a couple copies if you don't already have one. Um, and the, you know, it's, it's a really interesting precept that we have the upper Upper patriarchy, we have a bifurcated patriarchy in Roman Catholicism, that's what it is. We have the clerical patriarchy, the bishops and the priests, and we have a lower household patriarchy, and it's both are all male. There cannot be a matriarchy. Uh, tell that to the bishops, even though they act like the hens. You can't have a matriarchy, though. You can't have <laughs> households. You need What is needed is a man to be the priest prophet king of each home. JP2 called it the ecclesiola, the church in miniature. And the interesting thing is, of course, over the last 150 years, from about 1848 onward, that's what we've had, is a burgeoning matriarchy where women try to be the priest prophet king of the household final decision goes to them you know everyone's everyone's it's, it's a gynocentric world here in america nobody that is fighting for that is fighting against the patriarchy is like no honest person is fighting for a matriarchy where we where we're going to be the head of the household that's not the point. The point is that it should be your choice to decide how your relationship works. You should have equal rights. And it doesn't have to be like men don't have to be the leader in any sense of the word. And that includes personal relationships. Like he's basically implying that we're fighting for anyone, for, for women to basically decide, make all of the decisions. Like that's not, that's not 
being against the patriarchy is not that that's not what that means, my dude. I don't care in your own personal relationship. I think you I mean, I shouldn't say I don't care. Ultimately, I think the most healthiest partnerships um, whether it be a marriage or just, you know, dating or whatever you want to call it. I think it works well when it's when it's a unit. But sometimes, you know, being a unit and making the decisions together means maybe one person works. And it just means that maybe it's not the man that works. You know, if, if, if only one person is working, you know what I mean? It can also it can also be the, the woman or feminine presenting gender or however you want to see it. And the fact of the matter is also this whole concept of the patriarchy and the what do they call it? Like the nuclear family or whatever. It relies so heavily on such binaries. I mean, bina binary genders, you know, it's just man and it's just woman. But also the idea that it, it focuses on relationships that are that are between hetero cis heterosexual people and like that doesn't fit in our modern times like it it literally doesn't fit okay it does it doesn't work and it's not represent representative of all relationships i am not like against a heterosexual couple following that 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 ideology well not i don't want to say following the ideology but i don't have a problem with them um participating in a relationship or partnership that does kind of appeal to the, the alt-right like say like the the man does work and the and the woman is a stay-at-home mom you know if just because that just because they seem to be following be following those types of you know rules that that the alt-right thinks are the best fit for a family doesn't mean I'm like against that I don't care what you it's, it's it's literally just about choice it's about what works for that couple and what makes them happy nobody's against that type of family or dynamic in the relationship what we're against is forcing that dynamic on everybody else and acting like it's the only dynamic that actually exists or works because it's it's not it just isn't america now um brookings institute which is not a right-wing think tank prints this, these facts i always say it's pew research but it's brookings that show that if your if one's mother is the one that drags them to church and enforces the you know the rigor of practicing the faith then there's a huge attrition rate because neither the young boys nor the young girls take that seriously and that's what me and all my friends grow it seems like you're hopping to a conclusion that's not actually i would I would need to know more about this study because a lot of times, a lot of times the alt right will use studies to force a conclusion that the study's not actually saying. You know, you know what I mean. Like, no, 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 no. That that's not how studies work. You don't get to say what the study is saying based on your perceptions of the result. There are a multitude of things in society that can cause certain things to happen with certain groups of people. That does not mean it is the result of this factor. You know, you can force your own agenda into certain studies um, to fit what you already what you already believe. I mean, it'd be like saying black people are poor because they're black and not actually getting into the results of what actually causes poverty and why there may be more black people in poverty. Like it ignores all of these other factors and just forces an agenda that that fits your beliefs to the core. So I don't know what study he's referencing or what he's talking about, but I doubt that that is what the study is actually saying. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, that's what we had. And I think now still people growing up in the 2000s, it's like, if you were a cradle Catholic, your mom was dragging you to church. That's the, the devil's final assault on the family that Sister Lucy of Fatima wrote to Cardinal Carlo Cafaro, rest his soul, in 1981. When the father, this is Brookings research, when the father takes the family to church, you know what the uh, attrition rate is? It's next to zero. I mean, it's like, it's the normal 20%. But it's like 80% retention rate if the father's the one bringing everyone to church. He's the passionate one. It's like 20% retention rate when it's just the mother. What is it when it's both of them together? It's the exact same as what it is when the father's taking him to church. That, that proves the, the mother adds so much to the family, but adds nothing to being the priest, prophet, king of the household. What pleases me about your guy's story in this lengthy, <sighs> verbose question is the way it worked and the way that I, I look at you guys and I just think, what a great young couple. The way Caitlin talks about you, even the few mentions in the video, <laughs> brief mentions, that's a good young couple. That's solid. She's like, she closes the video saying, I trusted my husband. That's, that's foremost. That's not weird or brainwashed. Leftists would call that brainwash. That is nature. That is God's nature. I don't think it's, I don't, okay, hold on. I don't think it's brainwashing to trust your husband because I think it's in a healthy relationship. Anyone would trust their partner regardless of what their gender is. I do find the way Caitlin talked about love and her partner, I did find that concerning because the the blind trust, I would say, is blind trust is not healthy. 
trusting somebody just because of their gender, just because they happen to be your husband. I don't think that's healthy. And I think it, I think it encourage, it could potentially encourage people that mindset could put people in, in a place where they could be harmed because they are of the belief that their husband must always be right and their husband must lead them. And I think it can put people in a mindset that can be, that can be dangerous and enable them to stay in dangerous situations. I don't think that innately having trust for a husband is, is, is bad or brainwashing. That would be absolutely ridiculous. If you don't trust your husband, you probably shouldn't be married. And in the same way, if you don't trust your, your partner or partners, you probably shouldn't, shouldn't be with them or you need to work on that communication or whatever is holding you back in that relationship and whether or not the distrust is valid or for, for, for whatever reason or how to work on bettering your relationship so that you are having, you know, healthy trust in your relationship, I would say. Um, I mean, I personally wouldn't be with somebody romantically if I didn't trust them or I would want to remedy that situation so I could trust them. What do you say? I, I agree 100%. And I'm really fortunate, first of all, that I do I fall I into that heard, 20%. I think I just uh, heard my cat cry. Hold on. Yeah, you're back here. What are you doing? Hi. You want to come in? Pounce, you want to say hi? Come here. Oh, he's going to he's gonna go sniff my laundry. That's the only came in. Oh, he's going to walk into my closet. Okay. That's the only reason he came in here. It's like that was going to church <laughs> with their mother. And I'm very fortunate that, you know, I never gave up my faith in Christ. You know, I at times was not a very you know strong practicing Catholic, like I had mentioned earlier, but I still maintained that Jesus was real. The Trinity was real and that, you know, I, I need to receive him if I wish to, you know, gain entrance into his kingdom. And so I think in terms of a household, the flock is only as strong as its mm -hmm. shepherd. So a lot of people like to reject this natural hierarchy of, um, you know, we, we see these boundaries now being blurred in society where man can be woman, woman can be man, uh, the wife can fulfill the husband's yeah. roles uh, and vice versa. Ooh. So these boundaries we have to understand are here for our benefit because man and woman, um, they complement one another. It's not offensive to say a man should have certain roles and a woman should have certain roles. That's what true love is. And her and I, we have this beautiful relationship what? with one another that even when it was True love isn't isn't that somebody should have certain roles based on their gender that they have to adhere to. True love is loving how a person expresses their identity, um, regardless of what of what society deems that they sh that should be appropriate. As long as they are not actively harming themselves or others, why wouldn't you embrace that? Hi, kitty ASMR. See the little purrs. There you go. There you go. <laughs> was more secular she was always willing to defer to my opinions and you know what my convictions were because she loved me and trusted me with 100 percent of her heart so even though i had only returned to the catholic faith in september of 2019 and we were getting married just a few months after that when i came to her and said kate i think we got to do this right and do this sacramentally in the catholic church she even as a, a staunch like a atheist didn't want anything <laughs> to do with the church she loved me enough this was the christ inside of her willing to die to submit to what the husband felt was best for the family and it's a really beautiful thing to see how it's manifested in our relationship. And if I can real quick add, um, sometimes at night when we pray, we like to focus on how we live in a time where people crave Are you in signs the camera from God. Right people now? think we have a dead God that see. doesn't reveal himself to us. I think our lives and our relationship has been a true sacrament of the way in which God is still alive in the world because it's been You're so obvious to us. Down, my dude. And it's been obvious enough that it's okay. helped you to convert this year. Can I add something? My um, So my previous relationships, I was always... Um, I'm the, I'm going to control everything. I have the final say, I know what's best. And there's a reason why they never worked out because that was just a toxic environment. It was a toxic way to have a relationship and being with Justin and my dad. Wait, hold on. I'm missing. My cat is distracting me. I know I'm missing what is happening. Full relationship with one another that even when it was more secular, she was always willing to defer to my opinions and you know what my convictions were because she loved me and trusted me with 100% of her heart. So even though I had only returned to the Catholic faith in September of 2019 and we were getting married just a few months after that. Ah, thank you, Queen of Beams. Thank you so much. Uh, they say for Brina's ability to keep sanity and for the cat, thank you. <laughs> when I came to her and said, Kate, I think we gotta do this right and do this sacramentally in the Catholic church. She even as a, a staunch like, a atheist didn't want anything to do with the church. She loved me enough. This was the Christ inside of her willing to die to submit to what the husband felt was best for the family. And it's a really beautiful thing to see how it's manifested in our relationship. And if I, if I can real quick add, um, sometimes at night. Holy crap. This is, that is like, it's so toxic to just be like, oh, I don't have a problem 
with couples adhering or making room for their for their if they have different religious or spiritual beliefs that's not a problem but the 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 idea from what i understand from what he said it's like it's so beautiful that she that she agree to me wanting to have a catholic wedding because she basically put my feelings ahead of her own like i'm like what like like that that's what it needs to be praised the fact that she gave me room to present myself as the leader and like that's what he's praising basically her her submissiveness and obedience great cool like when we pray we like to focus on how we live in a time where people crave signs from god people think we have a dead god that doesn't reveal himself to us i think our lives and our relationship has been a true sacrament of the way in which god is still alive in the world because it's been so obvious to us how lovely for you how privileged you must be your relationship is a true demonstration of how god must still be here because you're just you're just that special you're just that special. Let's completely ignore all of the atrocities of the world. Let's completely ignore the mil the hundreds of thousands of Americans. What is it even up to at this point? I don't even know. Is it near a million now? Is it over a million? I don't even know what it is at this point. Who have died from, from COVID. Let's ignore that. Let's ignore all of the people that are starving on the streets. Let's ignore all the, all the, all the Christians that have, that have faced such huge atrocities and are seeing no end in sight to, to the, the horrors that they've had to face in their lives. Let's all give it to this God who apparently has seen some people of being worthy of, of his blessings and others not worthy of his blessing, of his blessings because, well, I guess they just didn't pray hard enough, right? Because if it worked out for me, then obviously that is an example of, of how God must be working in, in this, in this reality. And it's like, no, it's literally an example of privilege. That's it. That's all that it is, you know? It reminds me, I remember one of my family members when they were trying to explain to me why God must exist, they were giving me this like sob story and I, well, I shouldn't say sob story if it was a real story, I don't know, about people who like, what was it? Like they, they had, like somebody died in a fire apparently and they were supposed to be home at the time, but they ended up not being home. So they ended up serve or maybe they, maybe it wasn't that anybody died in the fire. It might've just been that a fire occurred while they weren't there, but they were supposed to be there. And therefore it's like a gift from God. And I, I literally, when, when he said this, I just asked him, I was like, how many people die from fires each year? Like, that doesn't explain, that doesn't give, that doesn't explain God. That literally just explains an egotistical perception of reality to think that when you survive something, it must be God's interference because he wanted you to live. And it completely ignores how many people died and that what you were actually saying is that for some reason, God thought it was, you, that God thought that you should live while these other people died. And then they'll go into, well, God just chose to take them home. And it's like, okay, if heaven is such this great, amazing place, why do you fear death to begin with? Maybe you should have been sad that you weren't there to die in the fire. Like It's, it's just, it's logic that just doesn't add up <laughs> in any sense of the word. And it's been obvious enough that it's helped her to convert this year. Can I add something? My, um, so my previous relationships, I was always, um, <laughs> I'm the, I'm going to control everything. I have the final say, I know what's best. And there's a reason why they never worked out because that was just a toxic environment. That was a toxic way to have a relationship and being with Justin. I agree. I agree. Ooh, I almost knocked my water over. That would have been, let me just, sometimes I usually do a pretty good job of keeping my water away from my keyboard, but sometimes I have like, I get a little close call where I'm like, Oh, reminder, my water should not be right next to my keyboard. <laughs> right now because you know when you have a laptop that's like just asking for danger but um anyways I, I would agree that that's a toxic relationship I, I don't I don't think it's a toxic because Caitlin thinks you know wants to say that she knows what she knew what was best for herself or knew what was best for her relationship but I think any relationship should ultimately I don't know how you would have a healthy relationship without it being a partnership I don't know how that works. Obviously, not everything has to be equal. There are certain circumstances and certain relationships where where some aspects of the relationship may be unequal, given maybe someone has more choices in this or you feel more comfortable taking that a step back and letting the other person lead in that area. But ultimately, I think it should be a union and a partnership of deciding how your relationship works for you, not just, you know, 
I get the final say in everything. Um, I mean, that seems like a control issue. And I would find that to be toxic, regardless of what Caitlyn's gen- gender was. I'll tell you this. It is completely unlike my previous relationships and my previous behavior to just say, I trust that you know what's best for me. I trust for you to make decisions with all the money. I. That is, holy, whoa, wait. <laughs> Wow. Kaylee, K- La, Kaylee, <laughs> Caitlin has really dived like head first into this whole like you lead everything. I trust you to know what's best for me. I trust you to make the decisions with all the money. Whoa, I would not be okay with that. <laughs> that is that I'm that's that's toxic to me. Like I, I wouldn't it's not that I wouldn't trust my partner, it's not that I don't, you know, talk to him before I make any sort of big purchases. Of course I do. But it wouldn't just, it, dude, if it was just my partner's decision what to do with the money, he would have so many more video games than he has. <laughs> just saying, like, usually when he wants something or I want something, like, we talk to each other beforehand. And if we don't talk to each other, it's usually a problem. You know, like, he'd be like, hey, you know, I saw that, like, $50 purchase. What was that for? Okay, maybe just let me know next time. Like, it's not, like, a huge issue. But, like, we t- we communicate with each other. It's not like I just give my partner, like, free reign um, to not be able to consult me with any of his decisions. I, I, I don't see how that can be healthy. I trust for you to lead me down a path that I will not regret and that I, I, I know will end. I, I would also say that that dynamic can be especially dangerous um, for people that are in dangerous relationships. I'm not saying that's what Caitlin's in because obviously there are circumstances where it, it, it's fine, obviously, for one person to have to bring all the money in if, if they're the only ones that are working or to pay all the bills or to have control over that. It just sort of depends on the dynamic. Um, like that's not auto- automatically a bad thing, but it can be especially dangerous for people who maybe aren't in the healthiest relationships to not have sort of an escape route. And I don't mean like everyone should have an escape route out of their relationship, but you do want to make sure that you're in a place where it is safe for you to give up that type of independence because it puts you in a position where you may not be able to escape, at least for less privileged people. I don't know what Caitlin positions in, but if you if you don't have really a means of making money or you don't have any control over any of the finances, um, and you are in if you are in a potentially a toxic relationship, it can really imprison you into that place. And I would encourage anyone who is who is allowing their partner to make all of those decisions. Um, or to have, you know, access to all of the money or to be the only person bringing the money in, I would encourage anyone to make sure that they feel safe in doing so because it doesn't leave you a whole lot of options if you need to get out of that situation, which is why a lot of, a lot of, you know, people who are in these um, conventional type of relationships where, where the man is meant to do everything and be the leader, they end up staying in these homes because they feel like they have no way out. Um, And, you know, capitalism has really imprisoned them to not being able to have access to leaving. Me up where I'm supposed to be. And my dad still to this day, we've been married for a year and whatever. (laughs) He knows the date better than I do. But he um, he says that it's just it's so weird seeing me go through this um, change in my relationship because I trust him so much. I know that he would never do anything or lead me down a path that wasn't the best for me. It's, it's It's clearly clearly. That's that's great to have that trust, but it's unhe- I think it's unhealthy to push that that is the ultimate, that is the only way to really trust your partner or you must trust your husband in that way because that is not going to be the best for every relationship. That is, that is, that is her own privilege showing, assuming that they are and, you know, that, that Caitlin is safe, which I assume she is as far as with their husband. I'm not talking about her political views or the ideologies or the way she sees the world, but like, that's not a safe, like, idea to push on everybody else that you, that you have to give it, it all up to your husband. You know, people change, things change, even in the happiest of relationships. I just saw a comment um, from uh, Raz, I think it was, was it Raspberry? No, no, not Raspberry Italia. Hi, Raspberry. Glad that you're here. Um, it was a uh, chronically disillusioned said, I have seen too many families ruined by gambling debt. Like, for example, right there, like that. Could, and that doesn't even have to be in a situation where, you know, where your, your, your partner is like unsafe or dangerous, but it could be that they are struggling with something like, like a gambling addiction. That would mean that you maybe don't want to put all your finances in their care. 
Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't even have to be like a situation where you're just like in an where you're unsafe. It could be a situation where you literally just it just you need to have that partnership. You know, you just do. Like end of story. I I don't know how else how else to say it. An ordered relationship when 99% of even the, the marriages that stay together are disordered. And one gets this look, I go to I, people invite me to their houses for dinner. I'm talking trads you know, that are supposed to be like the apotheosis of practicing Catholics and the husband's getting kicked under the table. And it's like, you know, in the, in the more secular sort of cultural Catholic households I'll go to, it'll be like just the wife running everything, the wife calling everyone in to eat. Did he just say like there are even like other marriages that are, how, how do you have the authority to say that someone's that in general to generalize all of these marriages is not working? It's not like, like, I'm not saying there can't be a situation where where the wife has all the authority or makes all the decisions where that couldn't be toxic. But just because the wife, the wife making all those decisions isn't what makes it toxic. And he's like basically generalized here and basically said anything that doesn't follow my cishet idea of what marriage is supposed to look like only between the binary genders of man and woman means that it's means that it has to, it must be toxic and it's not going to work. The wife kind of bossing everyone around. It's, it's awful in the cringe way we, we all recognize any place, anytime you go anywhere in society now, like feminism is. The Why is it so cringe? Why is it so cringe to, to for a woman to have authority? Why is it so cringe to look at a relationship where a woman is in charge and look at even even a cishet relationship where a woman makes the ultimate decisions? Why is that automatically? Why? I would really love for Timothy to actually go a little bit deeper into why he finds that so cringe. Why are women in his mind not allowed to be authoritative or make the final decision decisions with something? Because that's literally that's that's all that it is. That's the only thing in his mind that that would be a reason for it. it, it there's no other context given. It's just women making all the decisions bad. Central leftism. It is, by the way, central to the fall of Adam and Eve, right? It's, it's Eve acting like a man, uh, the man acting like the woman. And, um, oh you know, all the early patristics said, if Adam had dealt with the serpent, we never would have fallen. Yeah, Chris Austin says that, Jerome says it. <laughs> We've gone full mask off. <laughs> Full mask off with the sexism. The reason we've all fallen in sin is because God made woman. <laughs> and woman did not obey God or the man, apparently. Women just aren't obedient enough. That's the whole core of... That is so... That mindset, it, th that's one of the things that I really hate about religious stories. And it is not like... It is not contained to just Christianity. There is a lot of... There's a lot of different types of organized, large organized religions that point back to women being the fall of like humanity into sin. And it's just such a disgusting origin story. I also find it really interesting, like looking into that story and understanding like the idea of this forbidden fruit being the fruit of knowledge. And it's literally like, like, just think about it for a minute. It's, it's the fruit of knowledge, right? And it was the ultimate sin of a woman to eat the fruit of knowledge, to basically gain, to gain ultimate knowledge. That, that's what, that was the, fa that was the fall of man. <laughs> and it's just like, what does it tell you about the perception of people, uh, of the men who wrote the Bible and the way that they perceive women? Like, it's not, it's not surprising that that, that that belief breeds this type of mentality because even as a catholic that he is which takes a lot of those things to be metaphor what the metaphor is saying is that it's literally it, it's weird that he even brought it up because i because they do believe they do believe that the that those stories are metaphor but it, what the metaphor is saying is is what he just stated that we are the women are somehow more fallible more the more fallible gender you know in in society and it's just oh the toxicity in that is just it's so deep and it's so much that i just can't even like address it but but when you go to the, the interesting thing is when you go to the trad households th there's a sort of basic cognition cognizable uh moment 
where they're like, oh, the husband should lead. But still, because we grew up in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. It's- Wait, what? what is he saying? Is he saying like, tr- is, he, is he talking about like, like a husband who has like two wives? What does that mean? Trad households. I keep, I think I'm confusing it with like triad. I don't know what, what he means by trad. Tr- is that like short for traditional? Like, no, it can't, he can't be talking about, hold on. I feel like I'm confusing this with something. Cognition, cognizable uh, moment where they're like, oh, the husband should lead. But still, because we grew up in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, it's still the wife doing that Brookings Institute thing. I think I can only think of trad being short for traditional. Kicking the husband under the table and giving him an order to lead. And I'm like, guys, this this can't work. You can't tell someone, you know, you need to lead. It's like as silly as forming a nonconformist club or something. Okay, it means traditional. Raspberry says it means traditional. Tradition in terms. Uh, One thing you said, go, go, go ahead, Justin. I was going to say, I think part of that problem, too, is uh, in the culture we live in that, you know, obviously uh, with inflation. Oh, and yeah, have- yeah, 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 yeah. OK. Raspberry said trad wives are a whole movement online. I, f- I didn't even think about that. OK, yeah, I get it now. I get it. It was just weird to say, like, trad relationships. Like, in my <laughs> in my mind, I was immediately, like, hearing it as triad. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, I probably do, but I'm not making as much money. Husband and wife both having to work. It seems as though that kind of situation is set up uh, on purpose because the household becomes the wife's or the mother's where you know she's at the, ho- the house for most of the day. She's dealing with the children a lot more than the husband. By the time the father comes home, he's so exhausted. He just wants his dinner and to go to sleep. So he doesn't have that same interaction with his kids and with his family that the wife and mother would have. Um, whereas we are so fortunate that, you know, because we're self-employed, we're home together constantly. So we're able to value each other's input and do this together as a team um, versus I'm not out of the house and it's Kate's house. I just like how we use the phrase, we get to do this together as a team, but it's like, it's how is it a team if you're the leader? That's not a team. There's no, there's no team. It's literally just you and Caitlin. It's, you know, it's, it's our house together at the same time. And so there's a great book that I, I, I read before we keep, became- yes, I've heard of Mrs. Midwest. I, I haven't watched a video of hers in a while, but I am, I am familiar with some of her content. I think one of her videos is I'm pretty sure it's on my YouTube to do playlist of like things to things to talk about, but I haven't looked into her in, in quite some time, actually came pregnant. Actually, uh, I believe it was titled always a Catholic and it was about teaching your kids to, uh, be able to stay Catholic once they grow the age of reason. And one of the things that stuck out to me most in that book was that it recommended for fathers to try to find a way to work from home. That way they can be as much of a part of that household as the woman. Amen. Yeah. Now, look, this is a really important point. And you guys are at the beginning of your marriage. Clearly awesome foundation. Now, now you're, you're starting your, your procreative, the procreative part of your family. We live in America, which is, um, you know, I call it prod and light America. It's half Protestant, half enlightenment values here. And both of them represent a kind of rejection of vocation. Of, of natural and supernatural law vocation. So the standard story, for, it doesn't matter whether we're talking sort of enlightenment, the enlightenment's the, the intellectual grandparentage of the secular left, right? The Protestant Reformation is the intellectual grandparentage of what we call the religious right in America. Both of them exclude us. Both of them exclude the sacraments. Both of them exclude the natural law. So what, the Catholics were just kind of odd man out. And for, for Protestants, they really... The natural law, it wouldn't be natural. You're, you mean supernatural law. There is no natural law that says, like, the man must be the head of the household. That's not how it works in nature. That's not even how it works in other species. Sacra- um, they didn't have the sacraments. So their means of quotidian grace, daily grace, is was labor. You know, Max Weber talks about this in the spirit of Protestantism. So what would happen is um, in America, the dad would come home, just like you said, Justin, he'd be tired and he'd be like, well, this is what I contribute to the equation. Sit on the chair, whatever, get a get a natty light or whatever it was and and uh, watch TV and keep, you know, the one would keep the kids quiet. And then everyone would go to bed at 730, like good, good uh, wasps and whatever, whatever. So they go to bed really early. And then and then like there's no interaction. And this produced, particularly in the so-called greatest generation, this produced the hippies in the boomers, the worst generation ever, the, the boomers. They're like, oh, we've seen what the religious right has to offer. I don't know, understand how they're being, (laughs) how they're being so uh, oblivious to the fact that that is a result of capitalism and the patriarchy. Okay. Obviously, I think that is, that would be toxic for, for anyone if it was the, if it was a matriarchy and the women were working and that was, that was a setting, it would be toxic. Like it doesn't have to do with 
with God or this supernatural order of how marriages are supposed to are supposed to be. It has to do with the fact that we are in prison to working excessive hours and not and and if one person is full time to not have the ability to engage in their private life and their family matters as much as many would like to. And obviously, in, in that setting, it was mostly the men that were, I mean, it still is, you know, mostly the men that were working as their wife stayed home in, this, in these cishet relationships, you know. But the thing is, that's toxic no matter the dynamic. And I don't think that that's necessarily what pushed people fighting back against that. Um, it just means that, uh, like, women also have things that they want to pursue, you know, and also people, a lot of, a lot of people are not able, they're not privileged enough or what was the word that Caitlin's husband used? They're not, um, he didn't say lucky. He said fortunate, not fortunate enough to be able to have that dynamic where maybe where, where the husband is actually working at home, even if he is the only one working or where only one person is able to work, you know, um, because they need to bring more money in because they're not making enough money. Like, like, that's it. <laughs> has, it has nothing to do with being against men working or men being the only person working in a household. I don't care if a man's the only person working in a household. That's not what automatically makes that situation toxic. What makes it toxic is the idea that that's how it has to be. That's how it must be. That there is no other options for people. That there is no other examples of a healthy relationship. That it must be a cishet relationship with the man appearing as the leader in order if, in order for it to be healthy or, or work. That the man working and the man being the leader isn't what makes a relationship toxic. And it's, it's, it's like profession as vocation. That's not it. Instead, the Catholic understands, no, the sacrament, the sacraments, or we get the daily grace. And the man's sacramental commitments begin, begin at 5.30 p.m. when he gets home from work, right? Now you got to play with your kids. You got to play with your kids. You got to have fun. You got it like Teresa of Lisieux's parents. Now is when your workload begins. It's like Theoden of Rohan's like, my writer's got to ride three days to war and then have strength to fight. You know, that's That what literally has nothing to do with religion, regardless of who is working in the household, if it, regardless of what their gender is, if they have a family at home, yeah, when they come home from work, th the best thing to do for your family is to make sure that you're spending time with them, is to make sure that you're contributing in, in that way and that you're sharing, you're sharing the responsibility of parenthood. It has, it has nothing to do with, like, with the dynamic having to be the man working and the man coming home at 530 and, and having to do this, like, you you could easily have that type of dynamic with with different genders or the same genders or you know a, a cishet relationship where the woman's working and the man's a stay at home dad. It literally doesn't matter. And Scott on his shoulders because not everyone can work from home the way you guys do or or now I do. But um, it's it's uh it's a beautiful thing sincerely to see uh people so so early in their marriage having having all of these um, senses sort of intuitively. Uh, I I just I continue to uh, be impressed with you guys, but. I'd like to wrap up the Catholic segment. I want to talk to you about some post-Trump isms, um, but in a second. But one, oh one final point. Okay, I'm. Well, let's listen to this final point, and then I think we're going to stop this because I've been doing this stream for quite a bit, and I'm a little tired of it at this point. Um, I'll probably just end up doing like a part two or something maybe next week. Um, but let's let's get through this final point and see what he has to say here. One I wanted to ask you about, Kate, is uh, you mentioned pride, the sin of pride as a kind of counterproof. Why'd this have to be the final point? Why did it have to be this one? Because I was pretty upset by this one in the first video. Why did it have to be this one? Oh, no. <laughs> against atheism because of what you saw with the people that would lay off you when you said you're an atheist. The, the secular left in general, the, the, the vile, you know, hatred that they're filled. The vile hatred. That literally when Caitlin brought up pride, she immediately... It was so bizarre because... She immediately said pride and I and and I at first it was funny because I thought she was about to talk about the LGBTQ movement. But then I was like, oh, no, she's talking about pride, like the sin of pride, because that's what she's talking about. And I'm like, oh, stupid gay me. I was like immediately thinking of gay people. But then she immediately brought it to the pride parade and how it's named after one of the seven deadly sins. Like that's literally what she mostly focused on when she talked about pride 
which was so absolutely like abhorrent and disgusting because those two things are just absolutely not related at all. <laughs> like, dealt with. And the intellectual pride and the voluntary pride, will and intellect. How was this kind of a, count a counter? The intellectual pride and the. I don't remember Caitlin like really talking about anything to do with like the concept of pride as an egotistical emotion as as of being prideful in the bad sense like there's total there's completely justified reasons for any emotion but like she literally just focused on gay people like when she talked about this if i'm remembering correctly or proof for you so in the video specifically i mentioned pride month and like I said in the beginning of this uh, podcast here or this episode, I mentioned I knew nothing. I didn't even know the seven deadly sins. I did not even know that. And when I started to ask questions. I'm sorry. I don't. I am having trouble not just saying something completely insulting. Like, is Caitlin just stupid? <laughs> I, I just don't know how to really like, is she just that blind? to the world around her because I'm like how do you not and I don't even mean this as like an insult to like her not understanding religion but I'm like you would I mean I can understand maybe not knowing all seven like let's see if I know all seven here hold on uh pride lust gluttony hmm pride lust gluttony uh oh shit maybe I don't know all of them I would think that she would know some some of them. Hold on. What? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, shit, shit, shit. Hold on. I totally blanked. I would think that you would... My point was that I was trying to say is I would think that you would have to at least know the concept of them because, like, just culture. Like, you hear... Like, literally the seven deadly sins have been used so much... And like rea like TV and fiction and like I I think I'm thinking of like Supernatural the show because I know there were demons that were supposed to embody the the pro the seven deadly sins and also like um I think it was also a segment on Charm seven deadly sins has been used a lot in fiction um oh we got some other ones envy soft I don't know that greed is one isn't greed gluttony. Or am I wrong in that? Yeah, sloth, envy. I think that's six. So there's one last one that we're not thinking of. My favorite version is... I didn't even realize that. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. That's funny. Is anger one? Or there's? it's probably not used as anger. It's probably a different word. I would guess that it's not used to be... Is my cat in the trash right now? What are you doing? Oh, my cat's just hanging out under my desk. Um, wrath. There we go. Okay. Yes, that's it. Okay. I was like, I, th I feel like there's one that has to do with anger, but I know it's not called anger. Okay. Yes. Like you would even like, because obviously I'm not able to name all of them off and I was expecting not to be able to name all of them. I was hoping I'd remember more than three off the top of my head. But um, the concept of it, I don't know how you would be unaware of the concept I just don't know how you can live in today's society and culture and like be that. And there's a lot of the stuff that Caitlin said, like not knowing the Trinity, not knowing what the Holy Spirit is. I just I'm like, I don't know if I buy that you grew up in a religious household and you just didn't know any of these things. Like, I do feel like she's playing it up for the audience because that doesn't really just it just doesn't um, make sense to me. It, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem believable to me that you would be that that unaware of elements that have been so utilized in, in culture and in and, and media. Um maybe maybe Caitlin just maybe we just don't watch the same shows. Maybe she doesn't enjoy like fantasy shows, I guess. Cause I guess like the most I think if I think about like the most exposure that you would have to those types of beliefs, it would be from I guess the fan fantasy media or books and like, you know, T V shows and movies. Maybe that's just not her genre. I just don't know how you would never hear about it from at any moment in your life. That seems kind of like mind boggling to me. I would ask him questions, I would ask my Protestant friends questions. Um and when he told me he's like, you know, the worst of the seven deadly sins is pride, I was like 
oh my gosh, from a secular secular point of view, Pride Month has always been just disgusting. I mean, evil. Stop. And just Please stop. Please, please. I, I might hate Caitlyn Bennett at this point. I don't really feel like I hate anybody. I have a lot of dislike, distrust towards people. Um, I might hate some politicians, but and some obviously like historical political figures in the past. My sorry, my cat is literally scratching at the door. I think him and the dog are playing underneath the door. Pounce. Stop. Um, he's like swatting at the end of the, at the bottom of the door. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I lost my train of thought. What? I can't let you out there. My, you, my dog. Yeah. Storm's out there. He's going to get worked up. I don't let my husky and my cats alone together <laughs> to play for the record. Um, it's not a good dynamic that works out. They're only allowed in the same room if I'm in the room with them. Um, and actually you can watch them. Hold on one second. Chase. Can you just get him? Because the cat's in the room right now and they're they're playing. Come on. Go. Um. Okay. Uh, what was I saying? Okay, I'm gonna open this door so Pounds can get out. Get out! Go go go! Go run! Okay, um, I don't remember what I was saying. I lost, totally lost my train of thought. I got distracted. Friends, questions. Um, and when he told me, he's like, you know, the worst of the seven deadly sins. Is oh, crime. um, yeah, that. I'm just. The way that she talks about us is just so abysmal and horrible. And I just, I can't wrap my mind around the hatred that she feels for people just existing and expressing themselves. You know what I mean? Like, I generally don't have room to really focus on a hate of anybody, but to hear someone talk about people, like, just for the act of existing in, in that manner, it really does make me, it, it, it angers me a lot. Like, I just don't understand how you can be how you can be that hateful for no, literally no justifiable reason other than you're just a horrible person. Right. I was like, oh my gosh. From a secular secular point of view, Pride Month has always been just disgusting. From a sec, and also from a sec, ugh. I hate that she says from a secular point of view, it's disgusting. Just from a secular, like what? I mean, evil and just gross. And for me. Girl. Okay, let me fix what you just said. From a homophobic point of view, it is all of those things. Because you're a homophobe. That's it. Every time I went to a pride parade, it turned violent. And you wonder, why? Why is this happening? And from a point of view, pride month has always been just disgusting. Hold on. Sorry, I, I don't mean to play this again. Just I just need to gross. hear. And for me, every time I went to a pride parade... It she literally says it's... She literally says... it. it it's gross and what, what did she say? Evil and disgusting. And then she says, and for me, every time I went to a pride parade, it just turned violent. Girl, what did you just say about what are you? You're literally going to a place where people are trying to embrace themselves to combat all of the the oppression and the hatred and the lies and the BS that society as a whole has spewed about our people and then you're gonna go there and be like it turns violent i like i don't know why all i did was just say that they're gross and equate queer people to literally being a word that i i'm not gonna say on a live stream but you know what does the alt-right say that that what, what do they say about queer people that they commit crimes against children it turned violent and you wonder why why is this happening and I because not, you're because you're a hateful Ooh. I, just, I want to say so many words right now. 
sure that it was not a coincidence that they named one of the most disgusting, gotta watch what I say here, the most vile things I've ever seen displayed in public. And Girl, the pride isn't for you. Just admit that the parade isn't for you and move along. Who cares? Who cares? No one, like, why is being, like, a homophobe has to be such a huge part of your identity? Like, you can't even keep us out of your mind for fucking two seconds. When you're learning about the seven deadly sins, you immediately jump to, pride's one of the seven deadly sins, and it's called a pride parade? Wow! I could have been making so much more content on this if I had just, you know, had been Catholic for a little bit longer. I could have focused on that. It's a new way to shame queer people. I, so many opportunities were missed. She is such a just horrible, 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 horrible person. And, and I don't even know where she's getting. Oh, it's such a hateful community. Maybe to you. Maybe because we don't like you very much, Caitlin. We're not, we don't really have space for freaking homophobes to be showing up at pride rallies and letting them know how horrible they are for being queer and expressing themselves. And the worst treatment I've really ever gotten was from the people who call themselves, you know, going to pride parades or they celebrate pride month or they have pride for their sexuality. It's not a coincidence that they took the worst of the seven deadly sins. Oh my God. I am so, I'm like over this right now. It is literally just a response to oppression. It's just about acceptance. That's all that it is. That's all that it is, Caitlin. That's it. and made that their logo and their chant. I'm like, there's not a coincidence here. This this means something. But also, now that you mention it, I had a lot of- Yep, yep, it means something. It means that queer people, when they wanted to create an event to celebrate their identities and who they are and create a safe space for people to accept uh, accept others they were like let's 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 look at the bible for this let's decide to pick pride cuz it's so bad to be proud of yourself it's such it's so evil it's so bad i feel like you know what's funny she's using this these arguments but honestly i bet like her perspective of like white pride is probably completely different because you always see you all you always see these people like why isn't there why isn't there a white pride month we can't be proud of being white let's we should we should be able to be proud of being white i bet her perspective on that hasn't changed you know again it's just literally just using an argument only when it conveniences you and completely disregarding the actual history behind it behind why people decided to call it why they decided to call it pride month what they what they actually mean by using the word pride caitlin we made up language okay words can mean different things the pride that the queer community is talking about doesn't have to equate to what you're talking to as being one of the seven deadly sins even for religious people there are plenty of religious people who probably believe in the deadly deadly sins and don't equate the the name of this month being being equal to what is being described in the bible it is not equivalent personal pride in my entire life with my videos or how many views I would get. Yeah. Or, um, also, Gustav brought out like American pride, pride, like literally the alt right, just even if they don't use the word pride, they display pride all the time. What, what exactly like pride for your country, American pride, what exactly do they think patriotism is or nationalism is, you know, <laughs> Like, I can sit here and be like, yeah, I'm absolutely obviously for Pride Month, but I don't support nationalism or patriotism, which also involves a lot of pride. But it's because I understand that there are different contexts for when pride exists. It'd be like me saying, I've said this multiple times, I don't think anger is an innately bad emotion to have. I think it is entirely justified in many situations, but I could obviously also see anger being not justified in other situations because there's context that matters here. She literally just was like, her Caitlin's brain was just like, Pride Month? Pride Month? It says pride. Pride is the worst of the deadly deadly sins. Connection made. Like, there's literally no nuance or context, like, a room available in, Caitlin, in, in Caitlin's brain. 
Like she doesn't have room to, to actually constructively think about any of those things. It's it's so mind-bogglingly like basic that it, <laughs> there's just like such a huge lack of being able to have any sort of type of nuanced conversations with Caitlin or people like Caitlin. <laughs> You know, just, just trying to say, like, I did this. I did all this. This is all my work. And no one else has helped me. And it, it's all been me. And now that I can look at the things I've been given and think, I didn't do any of this. And I don't deserve it. You know, every opportunity I've been given is from God. And he's been able to work through me to, to display these things to my followers. And he's given me opportunities to do certain things to gain. Okay. All right. We're going to stop there. I'm done with this for it right now. I'm just, like, too irritated that that's the note that we had to end on. But I am I am ready to take a break. I will be back probably next week to do a part two. Uh, we shall We shall see. <laughs> Um, I appreciate everyone that has been in my live comments and Queen of Beams, if you're still here, glad that you came and I will see you next time. And everyone, don't forget to uh, like and subscribe and share my video and all those lovely things. Since I'm going to be doing, I have like something tickling me on my chin. I think there's like a piece of hair or something. Um, since we're going to be doing more live streams, I have put decided to put list my Patreons um, in my description. I also ended up putting some rules in my description for the live chat. If you want to check, we usually don't have a problem, but you know, just to be, just to be on the safe side, I was like, I'm going to be doing live streams more. This is probably something that I should have down there. Um, I always link the original videos in my description, not because I, I understand that a lot of you don't actually want to watch the original video, but if you actually, you know, need more context, um, or if I'm ever skipping and stuff like that and you want to see it for yourself, I also completely understand that. I would just suggest maybe putting your ad block on. Um, and yeah, I will see you guys Wednesday, I believe. And hopefully I do have some videos that I really need to edit. I just haven't gotten around to it. So hopefully I'll get around to doing that sometime soon and maybe get some, um, edited videos put out this week. But until then, uh, I will see you next time. Um, I believe I'm going to be on Twitch tomorrow at 10 PM. If you want to come hang out with me, then I want to play true colors, but I haven't, messed with my computer yet to see if I can get it playing. So if I'm not playing True Colors, I will probably be playing The Walking Dead. And um, yeah, okay. See you guys later. And bye-bye. Happy holidays. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Drink water and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> bye, guys.